<laughs> okay. So when I see myself, I'm, we're ready now? We're on? You're on. Okay. All right, we're on. Excuse me, ladies. Okay. Um, good evening and welcome to the school committee meeting. It is March 17th, 2022, and I'm calling this meeting to order at 7.01 p.m. Um, let's see, all members are present with the exception of Ms. Naborski, who should be arriving shortly. Okay. Um, I'm gonna start with the consent agenda which is a new item on our agenda I'm so excited about. Um, does anyone need me to pull anything out of the consent agenda before I read and we vote? No, great, okay. Um, so I'm going to read the statement about what items are in the consent agenda and I just wanna give you all a note that um, in terms of the warrants, the details of the warrants that have been signed will be provided in the minutes. So when uh, Lisa Aronian does the minutes, it'll, it'll include the amounts, okay. All items are considered to be routine and will be enacted in by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence on the agenda. So I would like to a motion to um, accept the consent agenda this evening. Moved by Stacy. Seconded by Amanda. Moved by Stacy, seconded by Amanda. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Right, and I'll move on to communications. So reports from our student representative. Hi, Roma, how are you tonight? Good. Thanks for joining us. What do you got for us tonight? Um, so just something quick. Spring sports tryouts start on Monday. Okay. So that'll be coming up. Um, if you've seen the crowd outside, that's for the METG drama open for public dress rehearsal. So they have a competition on Saturday, um, and these plays are this play is student written, so that's what they're doing the dress rehearsal for tonight. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, and there's actually um, a Ukraine fundraiser that a couple of the kids and teachers at the school have put together. Um, they're working with um, a Ukrainian teacher, Zina, who was displaced and is currently in Poland. But she's do, they're doing a fundraiser for um, buying Ukrainian books uh, to send to displaced children so they can, you know, be entertained, have a sense of normalcy while they're, um, you know, going through tough times. Okay. So if anyone wants to um, check out that uh, donation, there is a link um, to an Amazon wish list, basically with all the books that they want to send. So I can send anyone the link that wants to. Okay. Do you, can you give that to us and we can put it in the minutes? Yes. Uh, you can do, give it to me after and then I'll put it in the minutes. Okay. Yeah. And then people can have it for the minutes. Okay. And how long is the fundraiser going for? Like, is it like um, a two week thing or? No limit. No like, limit. Okay. Yeah. Just, just continually. Yes. Okay. Great. Anything um, else? And they're also doing cranes for Ukraine. I think that's Miss McDaniel, so the librarian and Miss Kuhn that are running it. And um, there's just been a lot of involvement involvement from the student side as well, just being passionate and being, you know, good citizens, um, just getting involved, basically. Um, and going along with that, Environmental Club just did a bake sale, um, which will which the funds will be going towards removing 90 pounds of trash from the ocean, which is really exciting. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much it for today. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'll move on to school committee individual comments. Does anyone have a comment? Minnie, go ahead. Okay, uh, so I have updates from HMAPA, which is Holliston Music and Arts Parents Association. And um, so this is for graduating students. Uh, their scholarship amount has been raised to $600, and the deadline is April 3rd, 2022, so please um, apply if you possibly can. Uh, also, in 2021, HMIPA gave out grants to the teachers in amount of $3,347. Uh, they are also looking to raise funds still. Um, 
Alison Quinnan, who is the president currently, has been in touch with other organizations regarding membership challenges they are facing. Uh, right now, their cookie dough, uh, school cookie dough spring fundraiser is going on. That deadline is March 18. And you can order through art students, band students, score students, theater, or the HMAPA website. Um, well, every dollar raised goes right back to the teachers and students in form of grants and scholarships. So that's the update from me. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Lucy, you had something? Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, and if, if you don't object, um, I lived my first, well, two of my first years out of college, I lived in Kiev and worked for a pro-democracy program. And I just thought, uh, in the spirit of personal, local, global, maybe we could take a moment of silence Absolutely. for the war, all the victims of the war in Ukraine. have any other would now be a good time for a strategic planning update um i think we'll do that when we get later? to the yeah to the okay. subcommittees thanks <laughs> you're eager though wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. um i just have one thing that i wanted to share um senator spilka i should say senator president spilka was visiting um, the district on monday night she came to the select board meeting um, in which dr Kuska, mr boudet and i attended and she kind of gave us kind of the state of the state um, and always been a great advocate of the schools, mental health, SEL, and we appreciate her advocacy and, and it, being invited to participate. And I just kind of gave her an update as to, well, after Dr. Huska and I both gave her an update about um, full day kindergarten and the kind of the projects that we're working on here at the schools and budget <laughs> and needs for more money. Yeah. So that's um, all I, I have for tonight. Right. <laughs> so anyway, so that's all I have for tonight. Um, Dr. Kuska? I have a few quick things. I received a couple of letters that are actually written to the school committee, but I like to share good oh, news. Nice. Actually, uh, Ms. Raffi brought a couple of them, and I received one. So this letter is to Dear School Committee, thank you for everything you've done this year. I appreciate all that you've done for us. I am very happy that we no longer have to wear masks. Thank you, Abby. <laughs> and then Dear School Committee, thank you for letting the schools have a mask choice for the rest of the year. You guys make good choices and do good things for Holliston. Love, Lizzie. Aww. And last but not least, dear school committee, second grade Brownie Troop 70611, I believe it is. I am happy with the decisions you make. I am happy that we not have to wear masks anymore. Thank you so much from Madeline. So, from the mouths of our Aww. little loves. <laughs> and today I did have a Miller School student advisory, so I've had a couple at Adams. This is my first at Miller, so I had my grade three to five student advisory meeting, and we talked about masks and how they feel, and if we're showing respect for one another, if we, about our personal choices, and they talked about that was going, the mask wearing is going, or lack of, is going very well. And we talked about what we can do to be kinder and make Miller School a better place. So that was really fun for me. And I asked them what we can do pre-K to 12, and they gave me some really good feedback on that. So I'm excited to continue to work with our students. I'll do the same at Placentino coming up shortly. And then I've had some meetings at the high school, but not specific to an advisory meeting. So I'm hoping that we can get that one scheduled as well. And um, you know, it's, it's good for me to get feedback from our pre-K to 12 population and see how we can make Hollison an even better place, but it's fun to hear their honest mm -hmm. answers and feedback. So that was I fun. love those focus groups. That's, cute. That's great. And then Senior Showcase was last week after our strategic meeting. Uh, Ms. Menard and I went over and were able to see some of our events there, so that was a lot of fun. And tonight I know we have the other event that we may not be able to make, but it's great that we can start to get back to some normalcy and have some of these events that aren't, we're not, we don't have to cut down on the number of people attending and things like that. So it's feeling really positive right now and looking forward to things moving in that direction. That's Great. Okay. And Mr. Boudet? Just want to, I happen to stop in and see the robotics team practicing for their competition, which is uh, tomorrow and uh, uh, Saturday. Um, I'm sorry, March. 
That's in it's, like it's, 19. Yeah, yes, it's coming up, right? Yeah. So they they uh, they were they have to sh grab balls and shoot them into hoops and also make their device climb up a, a ladder. So it was it was interesting to see. Um, there was parts of it that I was not necessarily comfortable being around, but that's fine. <laughs> but um, we wish them luck. They're sitting in third now. It's like a multi-week thing now oh. or something. So they're sitting in third. So we're hopefully going to bring home the gold. So where where do they go for their competition? <sighs> The Anything? first one was in Salem, New Hampshire. Oh, they have to like go. Oh yeah, like, right, right. So it's multiple day things. Okay. So it's 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 coming up. So we wish awesome. luck. Oh, I did forget to mention. I don't have the update. I, I need to get more information. But I know that some of our students attended DECA last week in Boston, and the reason I know that is because my daughter is a teacher in another district, and she said, I know I heard Holliston called up to the stage, but she couldn't tell me what they won. Or, so I knew maybe you can get that for us and get us that information for the next meeting. Yeah, I, I think we have a couple students that actually um, took home, I think, first place. One of them took home first place. Um, and then a couple others. So, yeah, I, I can check. And, and I think it's through our accounting department, if I'm not mistaken. We're new to DECA. I yeah, believe we are. This, yeah. Is it, this is the first, first year. year, I think, because we don't have, like, my daughter's school, they have a vocational program with marketing and things like that. So, in, but business classes like accounting can be part of DECA. It's a great program for students. So, yeah, if you can get the definitive on that, if there's anything different, that would be yes, nice to hear next Yes, of course, time. yeah. Thank you. Great. All right, Ms. Menard? We had a half-day professional development day just yesterday, and I'll be more than happy to give you some more details at the next school committee meeting. That's it. That's it. Mr. Verne. Do you have anything for us? Yeah. I know you do. I just didn't know if you had anything you wanted to update us on. Um, <laughs> since you're all, you know, you're here as administrator, so. You should be up here too, by the way, Dan. But do you have anything to update us on other than what you're going to update us on after? No. Okay. <laughs> just want to make sure I hit everybody in the room. Okay. All right. Um, so um, the chair of the, the select board, Tina Hine, is going to be joining us at some point. She's, but I think she's just visiting. But if she does come in, and I'll recognize her just in case she wants to make any because we don't have any other people that look like they're here for public comment. So um, if she had an opportunity to speak, I would give her that opportunity if she, when she comes in. All right, so um, I guess we'll move on to presentations. Dr. Kuska? Yes, so our Director of SEL and Equity, Mr. Vernay, is here to give us an update. His first presentation, as you recall, was in October, and we have started moving in a really positive direction. He's going to talk about that this is not a quick change in, it's a paradigm shift and a cultural shift to try to get people thinking about implicit bias and how we can support trauma-sensitive schools. So I'm really encouraged with the recent things that have happened. Uh, it took some time to assimilate into the district and now we're really hitting the ground running. So he's going to give you an update where we are and where we're heading, knowing that this is a multi-year process and it's going to connect right into our strategic plan, which we'll talk about as well. So take it away, Mr. Brene. Um, so thank you guys for having me. Um, I'm excited to share some updates. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of great work happening, but I'm also really excited for where we're headed in the future. I'm excited for um, our upcoming strategic uh, plan that you'll be talking about, but I think that that's really going to be leading us into uh, the future. And my work is going to dovetail and support that work. So I'm going to start a little bit about uh, with some of the things that um, some pieces from the beginning that I shared in October and then some new pieces um, for framing and then also some updates as far as the work that's happening. Specifically, um, I acknowledge that many of you in the room may be familiar with some of the stuff I'm talking about, but not everyone in the community is. So I think that every time I get a chance to present, I want to provide a structure and a framework for where this work is coming from, the why for it as well. So you might see some stuff from the past, but also some new stuff. So one of the things that I think we've all agreed upon is that we want to create a safe and supportive school district. Uh, so what does that mean? Once again, just to revisit, that's not a quick fix, it's not a thing. It's not a curriculum, it's a whole school approach. Right? We all have to have um, all hands on deck uh, as a community, but as a school. It's around creating community connectedness. It's about relationships between adults and students, students to students, and from school to community, and, and, and vice versa. It's about adapting and being able to have a school structure and a school, school district that can adapt to the changing needs of our students and our community at any one time. It's about supporting students learning and developing of life skills in supporting their ability to navigate diverse, the diverse world that we live in every day. 
It's about valuing students' identities, creating learning environments that welcome and include and support all students, and it's utilizing data in a whole school approach. We need data to be able to make informed decisions, but data that tell us about student experience, data that tells us how are we doing as a school district that can align, but it's also influence and tell us how are we doing with the academic piece and the instruction piece just as well. So in going back to this, safe and supportive schools is an approach, right? It's an approach that we want to overlay everything that we do, right? We want to create a safe and supportive school district, and we want our schools to feel safe and supportive, but how do we do that? So one of the things, as I've worked in, in uh, several districts, and this I think is even true to the work in, in most schools, is that oftentimes schools um, have a lot of people doing a lot of great work, but oftentimes it's not aligned. And what it does is that sometimes we get in each other's way, we're headed in different directions, we're not headed in a uniform direction. And it, what it creates when we're not aligned is it creates projectitis. It creates this initiative fatigue. It's almost like, what's the next thing? What's the next initiative? How long will that be here for, right? Um, it also is not financially sound when we're doing so many things, but we're not aligning in a certain direction. So what is it that we want to do? We want to create all of these circles headed in one direction. And how does that happen? Well, it starts with our strategic plan that will be coming forward, but it also starts by us having a structure uh, a, a, a framework for how do we see this work happening and how do we see it coming across the board. Aligning the work that we do from instruction to relationships to the community work is how we're going to get to the next level when it comes to really having a high performing district that is also safe and supportive. So one of the things that I wanted to share and this is a, a, a new slide is MTSS. So I'm not, familiar, I'm not sure if people are familiar with what that means. What it stands for is multi-tiered systems of support. The picture on the right is DESE's uh, visual that they use uh, for MTSS, which is a schoolhouse. Um, MTSS is a framework that is utilized to think about how do you build a robust system of support across the district. So if you can imagine, tier one is the foundation. It's the cement, it's the foundation of any home. Tier two, tier three is building up the walls, building up the house, and as you can see in Desi's picture, it's the second floor, the third floor. In many ways, when we think about the work that we'll be doing, and even the work that I'm leading, I'm thinking about this in multi-levels. But one of the places you always have to start out is tier one. Tier one is the foundation for everything that we do. Without a strong tier one, tier two and tier three cannot fully be successful and sustainable over time. So I say that to say, because a lot of the work that I'm working with our schools is about the tier one. It's how do we make sure that the foundation that we're trying to build is sustainable, it's authentic, and it can support where we want to go. The drivers at the bottom are the drivers that, that are the leadership drivers and the drivers that support this tier one structure, I mean not tier one, this MTSS framework structure, right? And as you can see, focus on equity is one of those. When I talk about equity in the work that I do within safe and supportive schools, at times we call it out and work on it, but also it must be embedded in everything that we do. It can't just be a silo thing of what we're doing, and it's be part of what we're doing. And this uh, MTSS structure calls for that. It calls for equity to be embedded in everything we do, the decisions we make, the structures that we build into the house. This same MTSS structure can equally be applied to the SCL and mental health of the work that we do. Right? This structure will help us inform what is the foundation that we want to do, and I'll get a chance to talk about some of those foundational work that's happening, and then how do we see ourselves building up to additional supports as we see this MTSS structure. MTSS is not a Holliston thing, it's not just a Massachusetts thing, it is a national framework for how to build uh, systems of support across schools. This slide uh, I had presented back in October, but what this slide is, the representation of what it looks like to develop MTSS at the school level, right? If you recall, one of the things I shared about this slide is that schools have to either build teams or use an existing team to, in essence, be almost like their MTSS team that has to have an eye on everything from equity to culture, to climate and culture, uh, to SEL skill development, to 
the academic success of the building as a whole. They need to see the whole MTSS structure from within. But how does that happen? It's looking at their systems, it's looking at the data and the practices, and then making sure that we have the right data to be able to make decisions. So that's the taking a piece from Rams, personal, local, global, that's the global. Right, that's the framework that we will utilize not only for the now, but for the future. You'll hear me use these words as we head into the future just as well. Uh, but part of my role uh, is to directly support uh, our HBS priority goal two, which is around equitable savings for the schools. So what I'm hoping to do is be able to uh, share with you across the district some of the work and updates that we see happening, but I'm also gonna present a, a school view of what this is looking like to start to build systems and what does it look like for it to come into focus at a school just as well. So some of the things that we started doing is that we recently launched uh, our first district-wide equitable safety and supportive advisory team. The goal of that team, it consists of educators, uh, leaders, parents, and high school students coming together to have conversations on what does it look like to build uh, a safe and supportive school system within, from within and for the without, and for the community. What does it look like for us to really work together to make this work? Building a safe and supportive school cannot just be about what happens in our schools. It must be about what we do as a community, but also what we do in our schools. It's a, it's a both and. Um, I've also started working with several uh, community uh, community groups, community organizations around building a um, community education series around safe and supportive schools. Uh, you should see a flyer coming out, um, uh, another updated flyer this Friday. Our schools will send them out. Our local groups and organizations will send them out as well. Um, we're going to have our first event this upcoming Tuesday. Um, it's around exploring how social emotional learning that diversity and inclusion enhance our children's learning and safeguards their mental health. Right? How does all of this work come together to build healthy students, to create um, a way in which we're supporting the mental health of all of our kids? So that's what this conversation is about. I encourage everyone here and in the community to come. Um, this, these meetings will, are not the answer, but it's part of the answer. It's part of engaging in conversations with our community around what this work really means. Take a sip. PBIS. So um, PBIS stands for Positive Behavioral Intervention and Supports. PBIS is something that's not necessarily new to the district. Uh, we've had two schools that have been engaging with PBIS, but one of the things, as you recall, that first picture that I had, of multiple circles and headed in different directions. In some sense, PBIS had launched the schools, but there was A, no district support to support it, to align it, or to continue to enhance it. So really what it had become, it had become what every school had made of it, but there was no alignment and there was no fidelity around how, how impactful was it. So one of the things we had shared out, I believe at the top of meeting, that um, our two elementary schools and RAMS had joined um, a DESE PBIS Academy in which we're getting supports for the next three years around professional development, uh, fidelity implementation, around PBIS Tier 1. Once again, you hear me say the Tier 1 because it's really geared at building a PBIS system for all students, the foundation from which to grow from. As part of this PBIS uh, system, uh, Miller and uh, Fantino are tweaking and relaunching or further developing a, their lesson plans or their matrices or their authenticity, right? Making sure that it speaks to what they want to be reinforcing as a school. Rams is creating this from scratch. So Rams is, is a new school, but, but this is about that alignment work, right? How do we get good at something um, if every school's doing something different? So one of the things about this work is to align how we do this work. PBIS is one of the few uh, framework and systems that is not only supported by uh, the Massachusetts Department of Education, but the Federal Department of Education as a research-based framework that has shown to sh have positive uh, climate impact, a reduction in behavior, uh, in overall support of students. So part of year one, uh, these schools will be participating for the next two years. It also, they receive coaching and support from the University of Connecticut uh, and the May Institute out of Randolph. And they also uh, 
part of that coaching is also for them to come out and every year do a fidelity inventory in which we get, I wouldn't say a rating, but we get um, with how much success are we meeting fidelity and then also support in building an action plan to get there. The goal of this is by the end of year three uh, to have a fully sustainable uh, with 75% or more PBI's tier one system that is sustainable and with fidelity being implemented across the board. Jerry, can I just ask her, as you're doing that work, it would be helpful, especially for, for some of us who our students already went through mm -hmm. the elementary system, went through PBIS, I would love to see what changes are being made um, because Definitely when my oldest one went through it, we gave feedback and the school definitely changed the way they did some of the, the PBIS. Um, so it would be very interesting to see what the changes are because quite honestly, sometimes, you know, when I read your slide, I was like, hmm, this is interesting because I felt like it didn't affect all students. Yeah. That it was, it took care of a small portion of students and the rest, you know, we really struggled with some of the... Right, and, and I did. think that, I mean, I can't speak for the schools, but what I can say is that I think that that's also what I was addressing, the fact that school had launched PBIS, but there was no district support or long-term sustainability for how does this work develop, right? Any From instruction to anything that we do, developing a system must be maintained and supported and consistently checking to make sure that it's doing what we meant it to be. When those things are in place, like everything uh, from in schools to a car, things get misaligned and they get into the wrong, right, the wrong direction. That does not mean that systems or programs are not, um, over time, with fidelity done, can be done well. It, what it means is that that support wasn't there for it to truly live. And actually, this came up in my advisory meeting with the Miller students today. They talked about bus behaviors and students not listening and things like that. And if PBIS is done properly and rolled out the way it's meant to be, it's about engaging our bus drivers and our custodians and our maintenance people, the, the whole school approach, that the kids should have that understanding that positive behavior on the bus is rewarded by being called out in a positive manner, then they're still developing what it's going to look like. Right now they call it shine, but it's not, it, it was never rolled out as a whole school approach because they never had the training embedded yeah. throughout the yeah. whole school. So you're going to see that once they decide, the, the acronym might even change. We haven't necessarily, <coughs> we're not there yet because we're in the, really, the infancy. Even though it's been in the building, it's it was never implemented with fidelity yeah. in the way it's in, meant in to be. In the year one uh, that these schools are in, for Rams is starting from a new, but for our elementary schools, they're retweaking in either relaunching or um, or improving what they have, right? And every school that, as soon as I started, was able to identify what were those gaps. And the gaps, in many sense, were it was siloed. They need, there was a lack of support, and there was no ongoing professional development to continue to develop that. Anything that we do, if we don't support that, it's not going to meet what we'd like it to meet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For someone that's new to the district or has kids that graduated 15 years ago. How would you describe the implementation of PBIS for a third grader or a sixth grader? What does yeah. it look like in a classroom, just in layman's terms? Yeah, so, um, and one of the things I was just talking to Dr. Cuska today around what might be the best way to offer educational opportunities about these systems, because I think that I could never do it justice in a presentation at a school committee meeting with all of the pieces I talk about, but um, in the essence of what is PBIS, PBIS at the essence is, um, it's a framework for a, establishing positive behavioral, uh, positive behavioral response and reflection around what is it we want to see. The staff uniting around what are the values and how are we going to reinforce those values, but also making sure that we're capturing data to support students who are unable to meet those expectations or those values, right? So, for instance, it might be um, that here at Holliston High School, respect is one of those values, right? Uh, so as a school, we might come to an agreement of not only how we're going to teach and support what respect looks like, but also how we're going to reinforce uh, in, in how we're going to re reinforce and acknowledge when respect is being seen in our community, in our district, from staff, from students. But also, what do we do when students are struggling to meet that, uh, to meet that piece? How do we re-educate? How do we support? What does the data tell us about what is happening in school? Why? 
Uh, schools will often create a matrix. A matrix is almost like, for instance, using the word respect, what does respect look like in the hallway, in the classrooms, on the buses, um, in the lunchroom, um, in the community, doing homework. And then as a school, once they establish those matri matrices, they often start to think about how do we reinforce and teach that. Right? Everything that they want to reinforce, we must teach and we must support to see what that looks like, but also come up with ways to support when, um, when students might be struggling to meet those needs. Right? The other piece that is 100% part of PBIs is data. Right? Um, we need data to, make, to, to be able to check to see if the system is running the right way. It's almost like when you go, um, data to PBIS is almost like when you take your car in for a checkup and you get a code. Right? We need to consistently be checking, is PBIS having a positive impact on our climate? in our culture. Um, and then the other piece that, that PBI says is also as a school, they start to come to a consensus of how, what does it look like for us to support minor and major behaviors? That's some of the language from PBIS. They differentiate between minor behavior might be that I'm disengaged and I'm not doing my work. Major behaviors might be something that I got into a fight, right? What does that look like at a school level to support a student who are exhibiting any one of those behaviors? And how do we support that student? The school comes to a consensus as a, as a team and as a school to make sure they're able to support that student. That is the global of what PBIS is. Oftentimes what you'll hear about is like, I got a, I got a sticker today, a paw. That paw represents oftentimes an adult acknowledging a student or a class that, that they were fulfilling the values of a school, that they were fulfilling the values of possibly respect or something like that. Go on? Okay. Um, so SEL. SEL is a term that we hear all the time. Um, and I just wanted to take to make sure that we had an understanding of what that meant. SEL is about learning. Uh, SEL is about uh, learning the essential assets for young adults and in, in, for young students and adults, specifically around developing healthy identities, managing emotions, achieving personal and collective goals feeling and showing empathy for others and for themselves, establishing and maintaining positive relationships and making responsible and caring decisions. If we remove the word SEL, I'm a parent. I know that I would want this for any kid I've ever worked with as a school counselor for my own kids. Um, this, this work is important, right? That's what SEL is. So when we, when we hear the word SEL, we need to be thinking about that it's about learning. It's about what are the skills we want to develop that is different than mental health, all right? Just wanted to point that out because oftentimes, as I continue to talk, I will say terms like SEL. And I wanted to have that foundation for what I mean by that. So uh, some of the other things we're doing is uh, we uh, have just launched and established a team of uh, counselors and student support personnel who are going to be conducting SEL resource review. For instance, the Rams Middle School has used a second step. Our two elementary schools have been using Open Circle for years as their SEL resource curriculum. Open Circle just closed, uh, so that's not a resource they'll be able to continue to get support on. So as a district, we want to think about um, how do we support that, right? What is the resource that we want to get good at that builds these skills across the board for our students? But as you can see, when I talked about those circles, with Rams that had second step, <coughs> Open Circle is our elementary schools. It's really hard for a district to get good at what we do if we're doing different things. So part of what we want to do is, is with this team is to start to dwindle down and look at what is the research-based SEL practices that are out there that are scientifically uh, researched, and then what makes sense for us to not only embed, but grow to scale and align across the board. And I say that uh, bring down the list is because if you Unfortunately, I would say there's about 50 to 60 SEL resources and curriculums out there. So as, you know, one of the things that when I talk about equity, we must be equitable to make sure that we're making the best decision around what it is we want to utilize in our schools. It's specifically that we can grow and sustain over time. We don't want to create that uh, project-itis when someone says another thing. We want to make sure it's the right thing. So when it comes to uh, SEL skill development, we're also going to be piloting starting now throughout next year, um, an SEL skill, uh, skill assessment tool specifically called the DESA, the Devereaux Strengths, Student Strengths uh, Assessment. It will help us assess strengths in regards to those SEL skills that I talked about um, and to look at what are the strengths that our students might have. 
We're going to be piloting in different spaces to figure out, is this something that we could utilize district-wide? Is this a tool that counselors may benefit from? We need to identify uh, those tools that will help us make sure that we're headed in the right path. Another piece around SEL, um, we're going to be working, well, we actually have, one of the things that I guess, let me first say, is that the Holliston Public Schools has some amazing, uh, amazing staff. And when I first arrived, there was five staff members who had attended uh, Leslie University's Institute for Trauma Sensitivity, in which they have a, a graduate certificate that you can receive on trauma-sensitive education. Um, I, I've engaged with that um, Leslie University for years, so they first approached me and said, we want to make this live in our schools. And as I got a chance to talk to our schools, everyone I've met, principals, teachers, say we should have this as a framework, as part of our framework. Everything that we do should also have the emphasis and understanding of the impact of trauma on learning. So part of what we're doing between myself and those educators and Lenz University is developing our own Holliston-based trauma-sensitive approach uh, professional development series for next year. We're also going to be working with Lenz University to bring those um, trauma-sensitive graduate classes directly here in Holliston um, and offered directly here in our school system next year. Uh, developing a trauma-sensitive understanding is not the work, it is a part of the work, right? It's a part of that foundation. So as we build upwards that house, and we decide where we put the door, where we put our windows, our back entrance, what, what the floors look like, that trauma-sensitive work supports that. It's part of the lens that we do as we build up this work. So um, building an inclusive school where students feel that they belong is essentially, is essential to fully unlocking our students' potential. So what are we doing around building an inclusive school system? So um, one of the things that we're currently doing is I'm working with another organization called Until We Rise. We're developing, I'm developing with them a professional, professional development series that I will be co-facilitating around culturally informed practices around student supports and understanding how cultural relevancy impacts mental health, right? Mental health student supports is about relationships and it's about leveraging that relationship to support students. But we need to come from that from a culturally relevant lens. So it's really about how do we build that skill within our own student support staff across the board so we can enhance those relationships to be more meaningful. Can, you, can I just stop you for a second? Can you explain a little bit about what And Still We Rise is for those yep. who don't know? Yep, And Still We Rise is an um, organization um, out of Boston. They're, I don't want to say therapeutic. They're, uh, they offer uh, everything from counseling, clinical support, but they also support communities that have experienced hate or marginalization. Um, so that's one of the specialties. We started working with them when we had our incidents of the hate that occurred um, this past fall, um, specifically around how can we offer safe spaces for kids just to enter conversation. Um, but we equally want to make sure that we want to build professional development for our own student support staff. Hopefully nothing ever were to happen in the future, but if something did, I want to make sure that our staff are fully able to engage those conversations, even the hard conversations to support our students. That's, that's what really this works about. Building our capacity. So um, you guys also heard me talk about climate and culture um, in our first meeting and the need for climate and culture surveys. Um, so this past fall and into um, almost right around December, um, Myself uh, and uh, RAM staff and Hollison High School staff, we developed a climate and culture survey. We piloted that survey uh, for the first time at RAM. We're doing it again in the spring. We're doing it at Hollison High School. I'm also working with Miller Elementary School to also pilot an elementary-based climate and culture survey. Um, the essence of that work is to drive our future planning, right? Um, we want to develop a yearly ongoing um, climate and culture survey. So A, we can see are we getting, what? What does our climate and culture tell us? But also, we want to triangulate that data with the Metro Health Adolescent Survey data, with mood check data, so we can make informed decisions around how our students experience in school. If you recall, I talked about the home school community connection. Mental health is not just a school related issue, this is a community wide issue. So, we also want to be able to engage in these conversations around tra data triangulation from school to community and have community conversation on what can schools do and what can communities do to impact that data just as well. Um, so as part of that professional development, you guys have also heard, I know Joni's reported out on that and we talked about it, the district has worked with Police Warnham. 
this past school year. Uh, her focus was around culturally relevant instruction, around building classrooms and instruction that sees our students' cultures and background as an asset uh, for learning while building a richer community within our classrooms. Some of the topics that she uh, worked on with our educators was implicit bias, microaggressions and how to interrupt them when we see them or when, we, when they're happening, stage in the stages of cultural proficiency continuum. Part of the work that we'll be going into next year is how to bring that work to life, right? This year was about building foundation. And when I say building foundation, it's about building the background knowledge around this work to then start to think about what does it mean to implement this work every day in our classrooms. That will be the work that we that we engage in as we head into the future, is having this um, cultural proficiency continuum come to life. You hear the word continuum because every educator is a different place within that. We want to continue to be building up our educators and our schools around that continuum to become culturally proficient. Cultural proficiency is also not a thing that we just arrive at and we're done. It's an ongoing process. Uh, also, as part of the profession. Um, just asking, I understand how the No Place for Hate initiative is sort of embedded in the high school curriculum and even middle school, but what does that look like at a younger level, like at an early elementary level? Yeah. Um, so the, the No Place for Hate initiative this year has been focused on our middle school and, and uh, high school. Um, what we're, the way we're envisioning our elementary schools are, uh, our elementary schools are the place where we set the foundation for a No Place for Hate. Right? So what I mean by that is um, empathy, caring, cooperation, um, uh, uh, dialogue. All of those skills are skills that, that happen from a, kid, from a moment a kid enters preschool. Right? That is the foundation from where no place for hate lives. If we do that well, and I, I connect that to the SEL, right? that's why in my eyes this work is, is truly integrated. If we do that well, that is SEL, but it also is a foundation for a no place for hate community. It's a, it's a foundation for an equitable community where students feel that they belong. That is how our elementary schools start to engage in that work, while also developing our educators to understand the work. Right? So that's the two-pronged approach at the, at the uh, elementary schools where our middle schools and high schools start to become the practitioners for what that work looks like. Um, and when I say practitioners, we've been doing whole class lessons, whole school lessons at the middle schools and at the high school and we'll continue at these places, not just this year because of the No Place for Hate. This is going to be part of what we do every year moving forward. Okay. Okay. Um, so in some sense, I, I spoke a little bit about the No Place for Hate, um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that when I talk about a school picture of what this is looking like as well. Um, so you also heard me talk about bullying, uh, and one of the things when I talked about bullying in my first presentation, I talked about prevention. Right? Um, all districts in Massachusetts must have a district bullying plan, but oftentimes one of the things when we talk about SEL and equity and all this work, we need to focus on prevention. Uh, so when I talk about that, one of the things I shared was that we might be looking at partnering, and we've partnered recently with um, Bridgewater State University with their MARC Center, stands for Massachusetts Aggression Reduction Center. They specialize on a lot of things, but one of their true specialties is bullying. Um, and they're known not just um, statewide, but nationally for working on the prevention side. So we recently had uh, 20, uh, 20 student support service personnel, so all of our counselors, school adjustment counselors, behaviors attend um, this MARC training um, to be uh, certified trained and trainers, but also to start to think about bringing that prevention work into our schools. Not to say it's not happening, but this is the alignment process, right? We want to make sure that across the board we are supporting professional development to align this work for prevention across the board, to support this work across the board, and to ensure that we're also offering lessons and opportunities for our students to engage in this, this work just as well. So um, also around data triangulation, one of the things that, that you know, I got a chance to share, I've talked a little bit about this already, but one of the bigger pieces is going to be as that this spring we're going to have our first data triangulation um, convening. This spring we should ha be having back in the next month, two months, our recent Metro West Adolescent Health Survey. If you recall, I just shared a couple slides at my first presentation, and I could tell by the responses a lot of people had never seen this data. Right? This data is important to talk about because when we talk about mental health, when we talk about youth risk survey, this is not just in schools, this is in our community. We want to build a community approach to this work. So when I talk about a, a data triangulation convening, it's going to be to engage in conversation on time and culture data, 
the Metro West data, the new check data, present and past, to come up with a, uh, an action plan for how do we want to make sure that we embed this work into what we do in schools, but also to engage with our community around what can we do together to build this work. So I talked a little bit about the global frameworking. I talked a little bit about um, the district-wide work, and the last piece I wanted to share was um, what does this look like at a school level? Um, so as a result of um, the work that happened, the work that occurred, not the work, the hate speech that occurred in our schools, um, I had a chance to jump right into the work. Um, and one of the things that um, I got a chance to start directly, I had to start working directly with our middle schools and our high school to figure out what is our response, but also what's our long-term plan. So I wanted a chance to share with you, what does this MTSS work look like at a school, right? To go from district to school. So um, this is a representation of what this work is looking like at Rams Middle School. So part of, they started the year uh, building out cultural sustaining pedagogy around cultural responsiveness uh, in our building in August, right? Around supporting their teachers around building cultural assets in our schools. They've continued, as you know, for the safe and supportive lessons where they've done lessons on understanding empathy, the use of the N-word, what is microaggression, anti-Semitism, ableism, uh, sexism and sexual harassment, and LGBTQA plus uh, communities. This is just part of the work that they're doing around um, whole class conversations and education happening within the school. Um, they have also, and this is even before this year, they've had passionate teachers who care deeply about this work, who've been engaging. Um, they created their own uh, staff equity and inclusion group in which they do, they read books together, they have conversations, but that same group has been empowered to lead and be part of the work that leads the school. Teachers leading the work from the forefront. We also, as you heard me talk about the partnership with Until We Rise, as part of that partnership, um, we're offering that space within our schools for safe conversations uh, within our schools. Um, and every, every week since we've started, we've had more and more students coming. Students coming are not just coming because they've been marginalized. Students are coming because they also want to learn, right? It's about creating a safe space where students um, can engage in the conversation, but can also listen and be part of that work. Can I ask one question? Yeah. So about the safe and supportive lessons, um, those are given by all the teachers, or is it all the history teachers or all something? All teachers. And so I'm wondering, is it the, um, the staff equity and inclusion group that sort of is responsible for like sort of educating that staff or supporting the staff on developing those lessons? Yeah, so the way, they've, the, the way they've developed it, and <clears throat> I'm reporting out on the work that I've been doing with them, but they could always do a much better job. But um, A, that group helps develop those lessons in conjunction with the leadership team. They then will often have a staff meeting where they will roll out that lesson with all staff, prepare the staff. Um, at grade level team meetings, they'll further the conversation to make sure they're ready. And then it'll be usually a shared PowerPoint or a shared presentation they do across all classrooms and then engage in some type of conversation. Thanks. And you know, one of the things that, as I say this, you know, I think the other piece to say is that this work is not perfect. Uh, it will not be perfect this year, next year, but it's a, all this work is always movement forward. And to me, um, is extremely impactful when you see schools putting this together in a real meaningful way, in a, in a, in a deep way, past just because something happened in our schools, but because they believe in this work. Can I just interject too? So I have been at some of the staff meetings when they're doing a mini training with staff, and then I've been in the classrooms when they're implementing, and some staff members are not as comfortable with this work because everybody's at a different entry point. So what they've also done is pair up teachers and have sometimes a second teacher in the classroom so that they can facilitate together. And, they, and then we, we really worked with, I should say, Rams has worked with, with the entry level of the person and the comfort level and trying to build up their capacity that way. And then they're modeling for one another. When I met with the Rams advisor group two weeks ago, I think, or last week, I, I don't know, lost track, that we talked about this and I said, so when you had the incidents in the fall, and how they felt about that, where do you feel we are now? And many of them commented on that these lessons are making a difference. So that, that felt really good to hear that they really, they're learning from this and it's making them think twice. And they say, we're still hearing things in the hallways, but people are pausing now because now they have a language to put with it. What is a microaggression? So, that, so elementary, they're not there yet to have those conversations, but definitely middle school, they understand why these things are not good to be doing and, and what they need to change the culture. So it's really, little by little, it's moving the needle. So, um, I have a quick question. So when you say presentations, are they done separately? Like, as in, 
they have a, a certain period in a day where they are shown these presentations, or are they yeah. taught within no, they the have lessons a, that they already like, do in the classes? They have a short block called the RAMS advisory block built into the schedule, so they do it. I don't think it's the same at every grade level, but they do the whole grade stuff grade and level. does it together. So the whole grade yeah. level doing it at the same yeah. time, all engaged in the same conversations by grade level. Yeah. And I think to, the other piece about this work is important to understand as we talked about. This work is, is, is will always be an ongoing process. So one of the things about this work is where I'm sure the educators are at today, they're not the same place where they're at when they first did their first lesson. The more we do this, the more we build this as part of the culture of what we do in schools, right? And part of this work is establishing that culture. Um, I've had conversations with students as well. And, and students at first, um, I remember them saying, some said we thought it was really impactful and others not so much, right? But this work, we know there will not be one size fits all. Not every lesson will impact every student. Not every assembly will impact every student. Our goal is to create as many opportunities to, to impact students. And that's where we're headed to, is trying to build as many as we can. Question. Oh, sorry, Dr. Savard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> I know. I was just wondering, and I'm, I'm very much aligned with PBIS and Open Circle and, you know, um, the, the positive reinforcement. Is the, Has there been any discussion about, you know, everything can't always be rainbows and sunshine, right? Like sometimes there are things that are consequences. Is there any conversation about aligning across the district what consequences look like when not only are you not, you know, you're not getting a shine card or whatever, but like yeah. we need to talk about what just happened. Do you mean like restorative justice? I that's what I was yeah. getting at, okay. but I don't know that that's a that's another project, right? right. So I'm not sure we're ready for another project, well, but I do mean restorative justice. I would equally say that PBI has done right. The when I talk about reinforcement, it's also about restoration. It's also about how are we supporting infractions. It's also about us having a common common language as staff and educators about how do we respond to different behaviors and what does that response look like? And how do we individuate it? That's also why we need data to make sure, A, we're doing that in an equitable way, right? The way we respond to behaviors, the way we respond to what we see, but also that um, if we're seeing certain behaviors appear in certain places that we're addressing it as a school or as a grade or as a, um, you know, as a hallway, um, but as part of this PBR is to have conversations around systematizing our response to the behaviors we see, right? PBI isn't, though, about consequences. It's about trying to move away from consequences and being so about restorative practices. Um, although we still need, you know, consequences is part of, you know, any system. Um, but when we talk about SEL, when we talk about this work, we know um, that the work isn't in consequences. It's in the opportunities to kind of re-engage and to learn from that. Yeah, no, and I, like, I don't know that we're at a place where we're ready to start thinking about incorporating truly in restorative justice right. into mm -hmm. the district, not yet, maybe someday. Um, but I think that, the, and, I had, and I appreciate that the underpinnings are there, but I would, I would be very supportive of having those conversations yeah. as well across district, you know, so that they're, so he, I mean, the consequences are also. What I would say about any of this work is there's no, there's no, like, period closed end, right? Like, all of this work, if you think about that schoolhouse model, houses are upgraded all the time. And when I mean upgraded, it doesn't mean that something leaves. It might be, you might continue to enhance. So restorative justice practices, us fully engaging in that, that 100% could be part of what we do. But part of that, what we do, is making sure that we build the foundation for that to live and for that to be, um, to fully come to fruition. So to me, it's a yes and, you know, yeah, over and time. I, and I think this is where, we're trying to shift to being a bit more data informed. When we look at discipline, are we looking at incidences so that we're seeing are certain students of color or by gender, are we actually disciplining certain populations more? That is really important work when we work on our equity because I, you know, I've seen this in practice that when you start to dig into the data, you start to see that there are predispositions towards certain populations by cultures and different things and you find that the inequity is there and that is why we want to use this data to, and start digging into those why are certain kids getting disciplined more than others because I do I mean this is really and this is all going to be embedded in what we're doing in the strategic plan and we're looking to try to do I think I mentioned 
priority needs, trying to do an equity audit. These are the types of things we're going to be talking about and incorporating that in the five-year plan as well. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. Yes, I actually, I should ask, do the students have any questions? If you, ever, if you ever want to, I'm right down the hall. We can always chat. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I'll come and eat lunch over here. Um, FCL work. So that was just some of the equity work that they're engaged in. And when I say equity work, I don't mean that siloed. I mean that um, the work that they're doing to create the spaces where all students feel included, right? Um, under the umbrella of what equity is. Um, but some of the SEL work, we talked about some of the lessons that they're leading. Uh, the school counselors at RAMS are leading SEL lessons using second step, but also enhancing those lessons. Some of them are on bullying, unkind behaviors, perspective taking, um, you know, growth mindset, etc. cetera. Um, their school adjustment counselors are leading social emotional wellness groups um, with, with a more structured mental health feel around anxiety, how to cope, self-regulation, self et cetera. We talked about PBIS and their team building from scratch your PBIS uh, piece. Um, part of also being part of the PBIS Academy is also to get to work with schools like, like them. So that's the other piece too, is that oftentimes when you're building something, it's really powerful when you get to work with those schools who are also building that work too. Um, off, another thing that they do at um, RAMS is something called the Zenden, which is almost around offering opportunities for staff to build their SEL skills around learning new techniques, new practices, suggestions on how to bring that into the classroom. Um, so they've been doing uh, calming stations just as well. They also have a really robust student support team that looks at students to make sure that they're either addressing what's the problem behavior, the problem um, that they might see, but also what are some of the things getting in the way. Um, and then they also um, have an intervention uh, space built into the block where they're regular trying to intervene uh, when they see students struggling with either learning or behaviors or all the above. As I shared this work, this is RAM's, in some sense, approach to building MTSS at their work. This work did not happen because we hired a director of social emotional learning and equity. Although I'm working with them to build this, this work is happening because they have really passionate educators and leaders who care about this work deeply. A lot of this work comes directly from the educators. Part of my work is to work with our schools to think about how to enhance that and how to align that, right? Every year, what we should see is what we're talking about every year refining, enhancing, maybe getting to the space where we get the restorative justice practices now that we've built some foundational spaces, right? Having deeper conversations on what the data is telling us and informing us to have better action, right? Continuing to educate our community about the why for this work, the importance for this work, and the buy-in needed for this work just as well. So, just wanted to, I think it's telling me to wrap up. No, I think, um, I think they might wrap it up. Button. Yeah, but um, I just wanted to kind of take you guys on a journey of kind of a global context of like framework, what do we mean to, at the district level, some of the work that's happening to the school level, what's happening, right? And my hope is that I can continue to come um, in the future or schools themselves can come and come speak directly to you around what is the work that they're doing. Because this is just RAMS and every school has highlights that they could share just as well. Um, but there's also limited time for a school committee meeting. So um, I look forward to sharing um, more in the future. Um, and I'm just excited for where we're headed uh, and for how we see this work integrated in the strategic plan. Great. I have one more question. Um, do you have any thoughts about uh, parental involvement in any of this? You, like, I know they're doing a, a forum next week, but I'm just thinking about, so like, for example, I just saw the Sandy Hook Promise. Yep. I'm just wondering whether there's any way to incorporate, particularly at the lower levels, parents love to get involved in is wherever they can besides, you know, besides, you know, volunteering at the library, but uh, other places, and I just wonder whether this is a place where we could see more volunteers. Okay. So um, <laughs> we've been having conversations at our schools for those schools that have PBIS teams to invite parents to be part of those teams. We also want those schools to involve students into the thinking around what that what it looks like, what the next iterations look like. Um, those are those are often key factors to strong, sustaining teams is to mm -hmm. have parent involvement and to, if when possible, have student involvement just as well. Um, so 100%. Yeah, I think I'm thinking fifth grade leadership team too. 100%. <laughs> and um, the. At Rams, for instance, their no place for hate does include some parents. So okay. the other part of this work is um, continually building opportunities where parents can engage in this work and be a part of um, in helping us craft the work and model the work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Lisa, go ahead. Uh, could we post this online so that we can um, share it with parents? Yeah. Yeah, if you'd like, I can mm -hmm. share it tomorrow as a link as well. And you're going to soon to be released. Um, Jerry L's been working on a very robust website page. We're vetting some, he's been vetting, and we've been looking at the resources. So you'll see us sharing that out. It's almost, a, it's almost there. I know, I saw it on the bottom. It's, it said, please visit. And I thought I'd have it ready. <laughs> I thought I'd have the website ready, but I'm close. But on okay. the website, I put videos like, what is CBIS? Mm -hmm. What is a trauma sensitive school? Why does it matter? What is cultural relevancy? Why would it matter? Um, so that parents and family members can have a resource to understand what we're talking about um, and trying to offer multiple mo opportunities um, for that to happen. And also there's a, a family resource page too um, that hopefully I'll continue to add resources um, to that as well for families as well. So, that's great. I have one question and it's, it's a little uh, personal. If a student in the district loses a parent all of a sudden, uh, do they have resources or do they have any help that they can get? Is there anything for, for kids like that? Who's this? I didn't hear. A guardian or a parent, oh, all of a sudden, actually, like yeah. young kids, young elementary kids, if something like that happens Absolutely. in the community. Yeah, so typically we start with our adjustment councils and they are the resource to intervene with the student and the family and interface. And there are times where they meet, depending on the circumstances, with the larger group and, and discuss it with teammates or students and peers and things like that. But is there a specific resource? So I, I think it's more directed towards who is the adjustment counselor. Yeah, so how would you reach out? So what I would say is um, what I have seen is um, a lot of our school websites have the contact of the school counselors there. If not, you're more than welcome to, count, to reach out to me. I can connect that person with whoever the school adjustment counselor would be. I would start with a school adjustment counselor uh, to engage in conversations around what might be happening. Because um, they often have the resource right at their fingertip that might best suit a family. Every family is unique. Mm -hmm. So thinking about like what is the right resource, what's the right service, will depend on that family, right? And their ability of what they might need to connect, transportation, telehealth, you know, telehealth, et cetera. So I say that to say that there's probably not one resource necessarily to suggest, but what I would say is I'm sure the school adjustment counselor probably knows best around the resource. Yeah, and I, I, I have happened to be in situations where I was with one of the principals and one of the counselors comes up to us to let us know about a situation and they are interfacing immediately. I mean, I, I find between our school resource officers if they find out about a tragic event outside of school, they're communicating directly to the principal, to the counselor, and I, I feel like that information gets out very quickly and they're, they're right on top of There's also, interfacing um, with the other parent or the family members involved right away. House Youth and Family is also Services, another yeah. strong resource that yeah. could be a strong connection. That, that is one of the resources that I'll have in my site. I know a lot of the counselors on their websites at the school level have a lot of resources available there too, and that's always one of them. They're, they're, they're could be really supportive as well. So I have like a general question. Um, does the high school have like a therapist or would that be like the adjustment counselors? So our adjustment counselors are our mental health licensed social workers. They have various, some of them have different licenses, but they do have to have a social work background and that is the group that you would work directly with when you have questions. And we, we are fortunate that we do have a great team district wide and lots of resources at every grade level. So if you don't know who to go to, certainly you can reach out to your administration and they can put you in the right direction as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you very right. much. It's take me some time to get down. Bear with me. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, we're going to skip around a little bit, if that's sure. okay. Here we go. Uh, Here we go. Stay there if you want. Well, I do too, in case I'm projecting now. I don't know where Oh, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I want to move over to, um, because um, Ms. Bottomley and Mr. Jordan just appeared, I wanted to just bud, move over to our update, I guess. Capital. Discussion. Capital. Yeah, let's move it to capital. That's what they're here for. Sorry, I, I'm just going to skip around a little bit from the on the agenda. I know we were going to talk about policy. We'll come back to you, Catherine. But um, I want to take advantage of Mr. Jordan and Ms. Bottomley being here to discuss our capital and Mr. Um, McLeod as well. Yeah, why don't you come up? Yeah, yeah come on up. So Sorry. McLeod, please. So, Joey, you want to ask stuff? 
You can sit in the easy chairs. Right? <laughs> and I get a rocker. Mr. Jordan you know. is actually in between <laughs> virtual I know, that's why I was like, so we are on we're a time crunch. Borrowed time, so thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Like no, no, I'm, it just, it, it works out perfectly. Right, right there. Oh my goodness, what is happening? I don't know. I know, that's why I was so we are on. Why? That was awful. <laughs> Yes, I know. Okay. Yeah, what is not awful is Susan Green manicure. I know, I right? Notice, like, <laughs> very I know, I know. I know. And the principal Bottomley yeah, has I, her. She's green got the right color green, green yes. though, that Kelly green. <laughs> yeah, this is you just the only green I own, ah, but it works I, for it's today. It's perfect. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't find that anywhere this week, by the way, which is ridiculous, but anyway. Okay. Um, thank you both for coming, or all three of you for coming, because this was a all hands on deck request. Um, so I just wanted to go over our budget <laughs> capital request. Sorry, Lisa, I'm kind of taking it out of order here. But um, just because I wanted um, Mr. Jordan and Ms. Bottomley to speak to one of the requests, which is for cameras inside of our buildings. And I wanted them to talk about how they might leverage that um, in, our, in our buildings. And then I also asked um, Mr. McLeod to come and discuss um, all of our technology needs in a little more detail with some cost estimates because he can really only speak to that in a level that maybe some of us could understand, or at least maybe some of the other people watching might understand. <laughs> so we'll do capital budget first. And yes, and then we'll go together. back. We'll okay. go back. So anyway. Okay. So. Do you want me to start? start? Oh, okay. So uh, we're going to talk about the operating budget and the capital budget tonight. For folks at home who don't know, the operating budget is... Uh, the part that you know funds our daily expenses like the payroll capital budget is generally one-time expenses um like building a new high school uh, we're not doing that right now um but um it all uh the the process which i'll go over in more detail later when we do the formal presentation is uh the budget subcommittee makes its recommendation which is what we're doing tonight hence the presentation um and then the school committee as a whole votes and then we have a few more things to do. We're going to have a stop at the finance committee next week. We have a public hearing coming up, but I'm going to go over this in more detail later. Um, but that it's important to remember that town meeting has the final say on all budgets, including uh, the school budget. So um, we're going to come back to the operating budget. But for now, the capital budget um, has two items on it. And uh, the budget subcommittee aligned with Dr. Cusco. We are supporting her recommendation, which is a total of $295,000 for um, indoor cameras and for technology infrastructure. The indoor cameras are around $20,000. Um, you guys probably remember in 2019, we posted some cameras outside, and now we feel like uh, it is potentially time to have some cameras in the hallways at both Rams and the high school. And this is something that we hope will be directly in support of what we were just talking about, safe and support schools. Um, the camera's gonna help um, as a deterrent to behavior that we don't want, as well as um, help with investigations, which unfortunately we've had in the past couple of years and maybe we won't have again, and uh, the deterrent effect will work. Um, the other piece is technology infrastructure. Um, we need some upgrades to provide a reliable and robust internet connectivity to support current and future digital instruction and computer science initiatives. So that's 275,000 of the 295,000. So um, to get some more details, We'll go to the administrators. Who wants to go first? <laughs> do you want to do technology first or cameras first? Let's do, do cameras. Mr. Jordan yes. first. He's got to get yes. out of here. Let's do cameras He's first. got 10 minutes. Go. <laughs> right, so we talked at budget some about some of the incidents that have happened. You know, we had the hate speech incidents in, in the fall. But in addition, we had some TikTok incidences. We had some vandalism in bathrooms. And we don't have the luxury of multiple people to be monitoring the halls at all times. And as much as we're working on positive behavioral interventions, it takes time to build that capacity. And there are still going to be incidences. So we really want to look at this as a preventative measure. Um, I don't know of any schools that don't have this um, at this day and age. Many of them, actually I was speaking with my daughter about different things that we're working on in Holliston. And, 
she said, Mom, I had that when I was in high school, and she's 35, so do the math on that. She said 20 years ago she remembers having cameras. So we're not looking at invading privacy. We're not looking at it. It's really about as needed to have a resource to speed up investigations because our administrators are taking an exorbitant amount of time. And the message is that we can't tolerate these incidents as well. So you certainly can speak to that as well and how how you feel it would help you and aid you in these situations. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. Like, there, there are things that are, that are known to the public as far as some of the hate speech that's been in some of our bathrooms um, and where even when we're kind of uh, addressing it and are on kind of like a more of a tier one as far as the education for our students, we have, we'll, we'll have repeat occurrences. And one of the challenges that we've had is we've, um, even though we have sign-up sheets and different things that we can we can isolate it down to a time frame, but within that time frame, there's still the possibility of 15, 20 students that are within that time frame. And then you know your best tool is just to be able to talk with them and their parents, but then there's not there's not like a next step. Um, and that's not that's been something that's hard been hard for I think many of our families to kind of swallow is that like that's as far as we're able to really reach um, with that. Um, we, we've also had some cases recently of some items going missing from teachers' classrooms, uh, as far as like personal items and things being taken uh, during the, at night uh, and during the school day, uh, as well during like uh, different transitionary times. It is something that's been a point of conversation amongst uh, uh, our area uh, principals. So we, um, I have a, a larger group about, of about 60 middle school principals that communicate back and forth. Uh, and one of our topics was about uh, a couple months ago was that this was something that either either they already had or this is something that was becoming part of their budget this year. Um, Hopkinton being the most recently one, um, I think that voted whether it was tonight or recently as well, their middle school will be uh, putting in the cameras inside uh, as well. So um, it is not something that we, we hope we don't have to use it very, very often, uh, but it is something that provides us with just kind of like that uh, that assurance that we can close the door on some of these really escalating, uh, escalated events. So just to be clear, this is a passive surveillance, yes? Correct. So we view it as an investigative tool. It's one investigative tool, right? So having the cameras is incredibly helpful, and it's one piece of the puzzle set that we put together. It doesn't mean that viewing somebody on the camera is going to be an automatic um, you know, guilt by association or anything like that. It is the, just one tool that we would use in compilation with everything else to be able to help us continue to have safe and supportive schools for all. Um, you know, Mr. Jordan mentioned um, some of the, the potential items going missing, um, vandalism, uh, other issues that come up that are, are normal occurrences that come up from time to time. This would be helpful in that aspect. Um, in a prior district that I worked in, and now we're going back quite a ways, but about 15 years ago um, when they brought the cameras into the school, there were similar um, concerns and questions around, is this going to be passive surveillance? How is this going to work? Um, and very quickly, I think any of the concerns were um, alleviated by the, the way that the administration approached using the cameras in a very thoughtful and confidential way, and also um, the benefit that they brought to being able to very quickly um, address the situation and then be able to apply restorative practices so that whoever was responsible for that learns from that and there's, they're able to make restitution to the community as well and move forward as uh, you know, a safer environment. I would also say like the, the greatest value of the cameras is not even the investigation, it's the deterrent um, that it provides. So like our outside cameras, prior to our outside cameras, um, I could indicate the number of times that we've had some like outdoor vandalism or somebody trying to kick in through the back a back window or whatever that and I haven't I haven't noticed that at all um, since uh, since uh, we've had some of the outside cameras. Uh, not that we, we've had cases where we've utilized the outside cameras to catch anything, uh, but what I would notice is that it's, it's reduced the amount of like outdoor uh, vandalism that we've had just as a deterrent. I think the message that is there that they're there so that they, that has caused students to just avoid that, that situation. Amanda? I just want to clarify, I had some concerns that I've heard from parents. These are, are these going to be in the classrooms or just in the hallways? Just a simple answer on supplies. 20,000 does not buy a lot of cameras. So <laughs> looking at yeah. really 
places where students are unmonitored, because in classrooms they should be with their teachers. And so it's really those traffic areas that we can't monitor 24-7. So, so hallways. Not, so, so hallways. Hallways. So it's just for hallways. I, I know this. I just want to get back. Yes. yes. Just you. for hallways. It's not filming students in class. No, and, and we no can't. public viewing of these tapes. Absolutely not. In case not. of emergency, you can check the tape. And you will find that we are very limited in who we would even have access to. So the building principals will have access to the monitor. I will have access. And Mr. Boudet has it as far as the outside, which has been very helpful School because he said, actually, at this point, Maybe no, not. but they oh, okay. would view it probably with the administrators. Okay. Want. We want to limit it, especially when we do. But Mr. Boudet has found the cameras outside very helpful when we've had late buses and things like that. He can go on and see and identify which buses are coming late, which helps us communicate. So there's, there's a lot of positive reasons to have these. It's not all about discipline. It's not all about investigations. It, ultimately, it's about just providing a more safe environment. Unless we're talking about catching people shoveling the turf. Yes, that that's true. He, he has he has found that happening. Okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Lisa. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, I wonder. I'm, I'm guessing the answer is no, but I'm wondering if this will have any effect on helping us with the vaping issue. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? The vaping issue. Oh, vaping. I really. I don't. I'm guessing kids aren't vaping in the hallways, but I'm wondering if. They're in the bathrooms. Come, out. I don't know. I'm, I'm just wondering. For, I mean, on our end, it's fewer and far between. So this is probably, you know, a nice softball for Nicole. But like, we, um, <laughs> we do, uh, especially towards the second half of the year, our eighth grade bathrooms um, start to smell a little different, uh, and um, we suspect vaping. And one of the harder things is, is kind of is noticing who's going in and out and, and during when, and that might that might assist with that. It might okay. help a little bit. Yeah. It might. OK. okay. I hesitate to even say this out loud, yeah. but um, <laughs> we are in a better spot now than we were a few years ago with vaping. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the peak in vaping that we saw, and part of that, I, I truly believe part of it was the interruption from the pandemic yeah. in the sure. last two years. It, it has shifted some things. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't have an issue. We're in a different spot than we were a couple of years ago. That being said, um, you know, again, it's an investigative tool. So if we are seeing that there's an issue of concern, if we're hearing reports in the bathrooms, then that that is another avenue for us to pursue to, to um, be able to see, you know, what's happening in the bathrooms. The bathrooms in, in all schools are right. I think that's a great point. <laughs> there's no cameras in the bathroom. Correct. No, no, that would be a privacy issue. Correct. Yes. Yeah. That's not what we want. Okay. Mrs. Bottomley had a, a, a great point. Is that overall, uh, our vaping is much less of an issue than we've had to manage in the past. I, I think that's one part is the uh, is the pandemic as far as the way to kind of interrupt some of that. But also, I think there's been a lot of. Uh, education out out in the community and nationally as far as like the risks of vaping. I think that we we had a stretch like a five or six year stretch where the perception was vaping was safe um, amongst our middle school students, high school students, and I, I think we've gotten over that. Hump. Mm -hmm. I remember Ruth Poti coming to do a great presentation here at the high school. I don't even remember when that was now. It was so long. It was pre-pandemic. Pre Anything pre-pandemic. I don't know. It could have been four years ago, five years ago. So if there okay. are no more questions from Mr. Jordan or Ms. Bottomley. Anyone? Going once, going twice. We'll let him get All back right. to his class. You're on time. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you so much Thank for coming. You. I really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you. Thank you both. Not yet. We're still. We're going to hear from Mr. McLeod first. Can I stick with capital for now? Yeah, we're sticking with capital right now. <laughs> Do we put them together? Yeah, we can. Yeah. No, like one capital. Yeah, oh, one okay. capital, one operating. Okay. So we'll go to the same yes, I'm just interrupting because they're here. That's all. Thank you. All right. Good evening, Ooh. everybody. Thanks Good for the presentation. It's it's just brief. So okay. <laughs> I was like, wow. It's Thanks, hopefully Sarah. just answering your questions. Yes. And Yes, so I'm just going to go quickly to a couple pictures. I think that says it all. But um, really, the theme uh, tonight for me is like being proactive. So we, we do have some technology that's driving these decisions, and I'll explain all that. But it's one of those things where you don't want to be caught in the middle of the school year with a device that's obsolete and 
have to pull it out and interrupt construction and all that. So we, we do these projects in the summer, and uh, that's what this capital request is going to uh, become is a summer project. But I just wanted to share it's, it's uh, you have, really have to plan these things out. I had a lot of help. Uh, I want to thank Chris Mayo, Lois Gorman, Anthony Master, Yanni. He was giving me data from the school about all this. And then Mr. Boudet, my good friend, um, gave me some insights today, which were super helpful. So, all right, so there's three basic areas that this $275,000 recommendation covers. Primarily network infrastructure is the big one. And then uh, the phone system. So our phone system is no longer supported. So I'll dig into that a little bit. But basically, the vendor does not support our current operating system in our phone system. So we have three phone systems, one at Miller, one at Rams, one at the high school, that control all of the phones in the building. So if there is an issue, there hasn't been. But again, that speaks to why we want to do this upgrade, is we don't want to be caught calling the vendor and then telling us it's not supported. Then what do we do? So we need to upgrade the phone system because of that. And then I'll talk about the repeater in a minute. All right, so the network, network infrastructure, there's a lot of uh, stuff going on here, but um, I'll kind of show you a picture which says it all. Um, but the third bullet there, uh, the servers, are, you won't see a picture of these, but we have uh, basically seven servers across the district. They are old. Um, the operating system is not secure, honestly. It's an outdated operating system. So we've kind of kicked this can down the road since COVID. We actually planned this project two years ago. It's now resurfacing. Uh, the systems are that much older. So we want to consolidate seven servers into three servers. So it's going to be way more efficient. There's some batteries in here, and I'll talk about the Ethernet connections in just a minute, too. All right, so the bulk of the project is basically this. So take the mic. So take the mic. Take the mic. Take the mic. Yeah, you can give me that. I have to tell you that. Can you take it? I'm going to get some wireless I know you're going to get some well, wireless with that. I'm going to trip on this. <laughs> I'll talk to you. Do you want me to hold it close yeah. to you? Do you want me to point? Are you going to point? Oh, there you go. Don's screaming right now. There's all sorts of noise with these mics moving. <laughs> Sorry, Don. Okay, Sorry, Don. Watch, 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 watch. watch. No, you're not going oh. any further. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Let me. So I was going to say we need wire. Let me help. Let me help. Let me help. He's going to tap for you. There okay. we go. Ooh. Okay. So that's a Chromebook right there. Uh, sitting in the Vienna. classroom. And that Chromebook is communicating with a brand new wireless access point at the elementary school. So if you recall, we, we bought uh, access points to our capital last year. Spring. Mm -hmm. Due to supply chain, they didn't arrive till late fall. So we got them in, and we learned very quickly that uh, this technology was way more advanced than our switches. So uh, that's, again, a driver of this project, is our switches at the elementary school do not maximize that access point. So right Can now, I stop you for a second? What yes. do the switches do? Yeah, the switches basically, Sorry. Uh, if you look behind the Promethean board, there's a cable, it's hard to tell. Yep. Uh, it goes up in the ceiling and connects to a switch. Okay. So that connects the Promethean board to our network. Got it. And then out to the internet. So the switch is the place where that cable ends up and then it connects out to the internet. So that's where all the blue cables in that secondary closet, they're coming from classrooms and wireless access points. They're all connections in the classrooms and the offices back to this one device. Uh, so anyway, right now that access point, the new access point is trying to help that Chromebook get to the internet, um, but it's struggling from the access point to the switch. It's only one gigabyte connectivity right now. So this project, when we do this project, is going to um, change that connectivity to 2.5 gigabytes. So again, it's all about increasing the speed of getting out to the internet and then back and forth the internet back to the device and out to the internet. So that's one part of the project. The second part in green is the uh, switches would be upgraded. The third part is down there and the next there are 10 gigabyte plus. It's one gigabyte currently. 
that's the fiber. <laughs> it's, a, it's actually a piece of glass between our closets right now. And when I say our closets, I mean the secondary and the primary closet. That fiber is 24 years old at the elementary school. It's completely maxed out. It's unreliable. Um, the connections on the end of it, they're very difficult to get because it's 24 years old. So it's time to replace that fiber. The high school fiber is a little bit newer. I think it's 20 years old. So these fiber connections, they, they worked great back then, but it's 20 years later. Only a fraction of the devices then today. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so right now that fiber is one gigabit. Uh, that's the max we can get through that. When we upgrade this fiber, it's going to be a different kind of fiber. It's 2022 fiber. It's going to be 10 gigabits plus. So if we ever want to go up to 40 gigabits, this fiber can handle it. Now, 40 gigabits is an insane amount of data. We're nowhere near that. But you never know. With AI and everything coming down the pike, who knows? Uh, so that's, that's the big one. The fiber needs to come out. And so that's going to increase uh, between the secondary closet and the primary closet. Yep. So the primary <laughs> closet is called the core switch. This is the one you don't want to mess around with. So two years ago, we upgraded the one at Rams. It cost about $20,000. It's working like a champ, uh, that new, new switch. Uh, Cause again, you don't want to be caught with that switch failing. That switch at Rams actually controlled the entire Woodland campus, which it had to be replaced. We're in a similar situation with the high school switch. It's 10 years old. Again, it controls this building, central office, part of town hall. So not something you want to you know, take lightly. So uh, the primary switches would be replaced at the elementary schools, and then the high school would be replaced. The middle school is only two years old, so that's off the table. That one's fine. And then from that primary closet, so all those secondary closets connect to one central closet. Very nice, <laughs> Mr. Burday. Uh, at the elementary school, they go out on another piece of fiber between the buildings. From the uh, elementary building to the middle school building, there's a fiber connecting them. That's 10 gigabytes. Gets to the middle school and then out to the internet. So that's the path. Um, as you can see, the wireless access point, we're good to go. The Chromebooks, we're good to go. So some things are in place. It's those other green things that we need to fix. So those, all those wires we were talking about, are the ones that are Yes. Um, the wires, when we replace the switches, all of those wires will be cleaned up. Not every single one. Um, but we have a plan to clean up those wires. So it's going to be much more manageable. The other thing you should know is um, the new switches are much more secure. They're much more efficient. Our staff will have much more visibility. So to me, it helps with staff retention, because right now it's a, it's a real challenge. Um, I saw Lois in the closet yesterday. There was a printer that was down. And she was digging in the middle of all these cables trying to find the port that caused the problem. She will be much easier with the new switch. She can see that all in the cloud. See the port with the label on it. That's the printer in Classroom 101. And it'll show in the cloud that it's down. So it's going to make our staff you know, that much happier as far as troubleshooting, of course, the staff on the other end. I just don't know anything about this. It sounds like you, excuse me, probably answer this as well. It sounds like you've spoken with teachers. And is this sort of like already a problem? Like, does wireless fail a lot during the school day? Um, um, actually, that's a great question. So honestly, things are working okay. right now. It's, it's that being proactive. Um, the other part of this project is it's all e-rateable, which I'll, I'll show you some cost there. And e-rate, sometimes the rules change. Mr. Bidet knows this. Uh, so we're going to try to leverage e-rate to help pay for this project. Uh, so it's a matter of we have new wireless, we have new Chromebooks. We're not getting the bang for the buck, in my opinion. So it's teachers may not notice it, students may not notice it. It's just one of those 
you well, have to I, build the foundation. I will say, I do hear, and personally, Joni and I were talking uh, about, yes. it, there's, it's slow sometimes when we're trying to download things, or she'll send me something from her office right next door, and it has to go all the way around again. So by the yeah. time I get, she's like, come on, I wanted to show you that. You know, so I know if we're dealing with that, and that's a small scale in email, but when you're talking about downloading big items from the internet or, you know, for kids, it, there's definitely a, a connectivity loss of time in that. And just want to emphasize one of the points here is the fact that, again, the, 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 the switches themselves um, are beyond their, their, what they call their life. Yeah. It's not that they're not working, okay, because they are working. As Dan said, everything's working. But um, if they need to be replaced, we have a lifetime warranty on it, but their life is over. So the, that, that <laughs> lifetime warranty doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah. So we would be purchasing at that point at 100% outside the capital project to replace things. And if we lose a switch, it means we lose three classrooms, we lose a, a lab, we lose, you know, wings of buildings at times. I mean, it's it's significant. Yeah. And I've been in a building where I was the director of curriculum and we had no technology person, so they gave me that title too with no additional anything resource-wise. But because they were MacGyvering it for so long because they had outlived <laughs> its usefulness, I can't tell you how much stress it was that we literally lost the whole building, and then I had my technicians running around trying to pick MacGyver, you know, because That's what it, it had long outlived its time frame, and this is where we're getting to that point. So if we don't deal with it sooner than later, we'll start seeing some of that where you could you could lose a whole wing, you could, lose, and, and sometimes it's a day. It could be during teachers doing grades. It could be during assessments. Yes. I mean, anything, <laughs> right? So it's right. the thought exactly. of those. I, I've lived it in the past and I don't want to live it in the future. And if you lost the course, which you would lose the building. And in the case of Woodland, you would lose the whole campus. Right. So. Catherine, you have a question? Uh, I'm just wondering, I can't, I can't remember where it was in the chain that you said something was also supporting part of town hall. Oh, yeah. Correct. That? Could that be a shared cost if it's not just for the schools? Does it have to come out of just our budget? It's not It's not coming out of our budget. This is capital. Mm -hmm. So again, we, 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 don't tell anybody. <laughs> we we pay for the town's um, internet. They get their internet through us, um, and so the, the the so it comes through our core switch. Comes from our core switch. Goes out to the fiber that's in the street and goes then down to town hall. Um, so. The, the idea of shared cost. No, there's yeah. no reason to because it's all out of capital. Yeah. It's, not a, yeah, it's, it's not a budget impact to us. It's or efficiency to the town. more than anything. Yeah. And actually, the town. I mean, their emails are K to 12. It's, we're all on the same yes. email yeah. system. as well. Right. Efficiency. We're all part of the same. You know, <laughs> yes. we share. So we right. share. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. I just feel like I have to ask to do my due diligence as a school committee member. Um, is there a middle ground? Is this an all or nothing thing? Is it 275 or nothing? No, it's a great question. Sure, there's a middle ground. I, just, just to give you, I mean, something I've thought about is suppose we do a certain amount of switches in the elementary school and don't do everything. Well, then again, you're not getting the bang for the buck because the, the switches, the new switches work together. So the new switches with the old switches, you're still going to be stuck with the old switch technology, basically, because it's all a system in the building. I mean, the exception is this high school switch, was, which I'm proposing. That one I'm proposing because I don't want that thing to fail in the middle of the year because it controls so much and it's 10 years old. So that's, again, being proactive. So sure, we could sacrifice, kick it down the road. I'm just trying to be proactive because the consequences are, as you can imagine, nightmarish. And it's all about, when it comes to technology, man, it's all about managing your bottlenecks, okay. in all honesty. And at what point is your bottleneck going to be? And, you know, you never like the bottleneck to be on the end of the, of the closet. Mm -hmm. You know, if the bottleneck is you have a slow machine, even a slow connection to the machine, that is a much more isolated bottleneck. To have a bottleneck at the back end means that everybody's feeling it. That's the thing. It's not a, you know, an isolated thing. Well, in this case, isn't it about labor, too? Because you'd be doing the same kind of thing, say, next summer, and have to do the whole thing all over again, just in a different location. Correct. Whereas that's what you could do it all at one time. Yeah. So it does save us in that regard, too. And cost-effective. Yes. You do it all at the same time. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And the, and the prices are not going down. So, I mean, right. they're not cheap right now, but it's, it's only going to get worse. Yeah. So you could say it any year, I'm sure, but. Well, again, Dan, Dan and I did talk about the pricing thing with regards to the fact is when it comes to technology, 
the prices don't change. This device is going to cost this amount of money this year, next year, next year. Just that down the road, you may be getting a better device, faster, et cetera, et cetera, more storage or whatever type of a device it is. But it's the price is basically the same. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the personal computer you bought X number of years ago of a certain caliber is going to be you know, $800, say. Well, three years from now, a similar caliber on the scale of calibers is going to still be 800 bucks. It's going to have twice as much RAM or something like that, but it's right. it's basically these price points that stay relatively fixed. Okay. Lisa, Lisa? question. Um, so I hear you on everything works, and this is preventative, but it's safe to say that this will improve reliability and speed, correct? Yes, like it's, like to Dr. Kuska's point, it's going to um, decrease those Wi-Fi issues. You know, will the teachers and students see a notable, noticeable difference? Eh, who knows? Because we still have our, our connection to the ISP is still limiting in some respects. Uh, but at least getting to that core switch is going to be a whole lot faster. The one in that primary closet, getting the connection to that is going to be way faster. So there should be improvements for sure. But it's it's about the foundation. Um, I actually wouldn't say we're, we're delayed. I, I would say we've maximized our current switches. Um, again, they could they could work next year, possibly the year after next. It's about doing it at the right time. I mean, we have this, these brand new access points, so. Just so you know, last summer we bought, we tried to buy the, our existing ones we had at the high school. It's no longer for sale, that one right there. So we bought the latest and greatest. There was no other option. And that's, again, what's driving this. We have, we have brand new access points at the elementary. They're not compatible with our switches, bottom line. Done? Yes. And you had indicated the switches, or I'm sorry, the fiber at the elementary school is 24 years old, the high school is 20 years old? Correct. What is the average lifespan? We've exceeded it, but what was yeah. their lifespan? Uh, I honestly don't know the answer to that, but we've we've talked to our vendor, and uh, they actually we we exhausted that existing fiber. We said we it might work. They told us it might work, but you're going to have issues, and that was based on their experience in other districts. It's just not reliable. Okay. So it's again, do we do this now? Or do we do it two years from now? We're going to have to do it. So it's just a matter of when. And the E-rate bucket that we're leveraging, the rules change, so you never know when that 40% is going to go away. Or what things are what things are going to qualify. I mean, I go back to the days when E-rate, you could do phones. You know, you could do our, our initially, we had E-rate coming out of our phones and, and, and cell phones and things of that nature. E-rate used to cover virtually anything. I mean, one step from typewriters, basically. Can we explain so, what E-rate is for those who may not know? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Not everybody knows what that means. I don't know if you, okay. Dan wants to take it. No, tech, Dan, would you want to take that? I'll take you, Rick, because yes. I'll do it with the cost here. Awesome. If that works. Uh, any other questions about this slide? No, good. <laughs> All right, the other two projects I'm proposing, again, I mentioned the phone system. Um, it's reached end of life, uh, so we don't want to uh, face the situation. We have to call the vendor about that. All right, the radio repeater. So um, this is a device that would help communication between the high school and Woodland campus. So right now, um, the walkie-talkies, so Mr. Jordan and Ms. Bottomley, if they want to speak to each other, it's very difficult with our current walkie-talkies. I'm talking about the school ones. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we've been told, and the safety committee is recommending this as well, is we need a repeater between the two campuses. So the police and fire can speak to each other because they have repeaters all over Holliston. The schools do not. We just need one. And so again, this is about being proactive. In the event of a crisis, we don't want to be that communication breakdown if it's needed. If Dr. Kuska is down at the Woodland and she needs to talk to Mr. Boudet here at Holliston High on the walkie-talkies, without that repeater, it's not happening. And from what I've been told, it's this Hollis Street Hill right here. It's the line of sight. That hill is blocking that line of sight to Woodland. In all honesty, one of the things I mean we really need to work on is if we had a, an emergency evacuation situation, you know, some of the things that we deal with or could potentially deal with, 
I don't carry my walkie-talkie because it really isn't useful to me to have it, so it's on my desk all the time. Today I was at Miller, and I forget who was texting me in the district, but I couldn't get a response back <laughs> through my cell phone. If we had this, then I, we, I would be carrying my walkie-talkie, and I would use that to communicate more readily, especially with Mr. Wade when it's a safety issue, you know. But it, right now, it's it's not a useful situation. I have it on my desk. I can hear the police repeater. That's fine if I'm at my desk, but like I said, for me, it'd be more useful to have something that I can connect to all the buildings when I'm out, so that if we have an incident, we're trying to put in a district-wide incident command, which means we have to physically go there and be able to communicate back and forth. So it is something that most districts have at this in this day and age. And does that connect you to police as well? So we can't be on their frequency. We have we can hear their frequency. We are not allowed to use their frequency. It's possible. But I mean, we would be able to give our SROs access to that, so that they would be able to get onto ours if they wanted to. But we can't use theirs for that. It's just okay. Right. But they could access yours if they needed to. Right. It's the, their radios are a little bit different than ours. So the school radios, from what so, I've been told, are a little bit different. So basically, if there's an emergency situation, police can get onto the system and they can. Send out messages. Is that what it is? You're, just, you're just monitoring different uh, uh, bands. That's all. So it's we, we have our own. Um, we have two, and um, you know so we're just monitoring different different bands. That's all. So that's the, the our issue is that again we can't get to um, a repeater to be able to pick up those other bands. That's mm -hmm. that's the problem. That the, if we 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 could again, as Susan said the, we can get to we can hear the police from wherever they are in town the fire wherever they are in town because again they've got repeaters all over the place. Those repeaters are not picking up our bands. That's the issue. So. And actually, Chief Cassidy and Chief Stone and our SROs, are, they sit on the safety committee with us, so we would talk. This is one of the items that was on our agenda. Yes, the universally recommended. <coughs> all right, so here are the costs for all these items. Uh, ah, I need the mic. I'll stay here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the only cost that's still in flux is the switches, but I'm estimating 140000 That's That's the retail price, so to speak. After E-rate, <laughs> we would get 40% back of that from the federal government. It's a, it's a program, program that's been around ever since I've been a director. It basically um, allows schools to fund infrastructure projects exactly like this at a reduced rate. So we have a 40% reimbursement rate. My prior district was, I think, 60% reimbursement rate. So it depends on um, free and reduced meal population in the district. That's how it generates that percentage. So right now we're at 40%. It doesn't mean we have 40% free and reduced meals. It's just a tiered yeah. tier yeah. tier thing. Tier. Yeah. So anyway, uh, the switches would cost 140000 After E-rate, you can see the savings. <coughs> And then the fiber project, uh, I, I mentioned we would uh, pull out the fiber at the elementary schools and these schools if we have the funding. Uh, but the other part is this classroom wireless projection. So what I'm proposing is um, a cable uh, behind the Promethean board that connects the projector back to our switches in the closet. What that does is allow us to uh, stream our devices wirelessly, and this includes student Chromebooks. So you've seen Mr. Bidet do this before. Um, I would have done it tonight. Uh, but you, the teacher can have the device anywhere in the classroom and not be connected via cable, and then stream their display with audio to the projector or flat panel. Uh, in order to do that, we've, we've done a lot of testing on this. We did it with Wi-Fi. The performance be between Wi-Fi and hardwired is incredibly significant. So we've, we've determined it has to be hardwired. We've talked to other districts, and the uh, hardwire connection is really important for that wireless streaming. So yes, the teachers and students can connect wirelessly, but the backbone of that has to be wired to get the maximum performance. So that's why I'm requesting for all the classrooms, because we're kind of struggling right now to keep up with the demand, um, we have this wire in the ceiling to connect to projectors. And we've, we've learned, which is really nice, our new projectors that we buy have built-in technology so we can do this wireless uh, connectivity. And we buy about um, 
I would say, 30 projectors every year. So every year there's going to be 30 new classrooms that have this capability. So again, to your point, we should do it now with the vendor, whether in the building, just do all these wire runs, because right now we're playing catch up. We're getting our electrician to do it, interrupts classroom instruction, and it's just not, it's not great to do it in the middle of the school year. So let's do it in the summer. All right, the batteries. Oops, sorry. sorry. Uh, question on E-rate, because I, I think I understand it now, but it's based on our free and reduced lunch population. Yes. And has it been stable for a period of time such that we're not anticipating that it increases to like 50% or 60% in the next year or two, such that we would have a better discount if we waited? Has it been stable? For the, at least the last 21 years. Thank you. OK. Uh, another question I have. Go ahead, Minnie. Just added to that is that do the items uh, that we rate sponsors change from year to year? But what Dan was saying is the program changes. So to say that it changes from year to year, it can. They're really focusing in on internet access and, and infrastructure. They've gotten away from devices a little bit. They says clearly has no, no telephony at all. Mm -hmm. they, they, again, they don't want you on a telephone. So the reason that it's structured that way is because in many of the poorer communities, they have more issues with having internet in the schools and you know broadband and it's just so that's why they're directing more in that direction because otherwise a lot of these schools would just say oh you're gonna pay some of my phone bill I'll just keep using that and not worry and so again it's it's that's the purpose behind it and in some of those schools I mean you look at an 80 percent reimbursement I mean it's a nice deal so okay. any other questions Just real quick, the uh, batteries, that again uh, keeps the uh, network running, protects our equipment if we have power outage, we have, have those often. Uh, the wireless management tool, that's, that's a great thing for our staff where we can troubleshoot a wireless issue much more quickly with this tool. And these devices like hang in the ceiling, we're going to get five of these in all the schools and they, they talk to each other, it's really a cool thing and they, they pinpoint the wireless issues for us. The servers, as an example, this uh, used to be covered under E-Rate, the servers are no longer covered under E-Rate, again, that's a, that's a rule change. So we, we put the entire bill for these servers, which is 24,000 estimated. The repeater is not included with E-Rate and then the phone system, as Mr. Boudet said, is not included. But used to be. Yeah. And so uh, can you just talk a little bit about the phone system? Is it like there's a phone in every classroom and it's like a handheld and the office can call you in your classroom? Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's just not supported now? Like, does it not work now? No, it's, it's, it works. It's, it's, but the, the device is actually sitting behind us here in the closet. Um, the operating system is no longer supported by the vendor. The vendor's NEC, and they've told us flat out your system is not supported, so you're running the risk of if something happens and we call them, you know, they're not going to be able to help us. So again, it's being proactive. Can you see the new controls? Uh, I'm not sure what it stands for. It's a good question, but it's, it's, it's the a brand. A, yeah, it's a brand, so that's that's our current system. And then this, this recommendation is most economical because it would keep our current handsets in place and we would not be, incur the expense of uh, swapping out all of our handsets. We have a ton of them for a new system. When did, when did E-Rate stop covering servers? That was relatively recent. Um, they cover caching servers, and so we're no longer caching for like MCAS and WIDA. Okay. So that, that was kind of a stretch anyway. So you really have to like get into the weeds and justify that. So I'm not sure when it happened, but it, it's been in the past couple of years. Okay. It takes so at least five years. So one of the risks years. of waiting on these things, and I'm not in favor of that, is that if they didn't cover, if they no longer covered switches, we would lose uh, $56,000. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. They're starting to cover more stuff. Right. Correct. You can see the delta down here. It's, it's 110000 roughly is what the town would receive as far as reimbursement for this project. I know that, I mean, 275 is a lot of money. I'm not discounting that, but um, we do get some some relief for that E-rate program. And caching is compared to cloud-based? 
Yes, yeah, so ca caching basically what it does is uh, for MCAS, it, it downloads all the content to our server, and that's how the Chromebooks communicate. They communicate with the server. And so now we communicate with the cloud. Again, it, it's an argument to build up our infrastructure to beef up that cloud experience again. Uh, so MCAS has really come a long way. Like it's, it syncs every question. Like when the kid, when the student clicks next, their answer is synced to the cloud. Yeah, yeah it, I mean, uh, it's so a great goes out or something when, the MCAS. Yeah, when yeah. MCAS went this route, it really, that was some the only way that districts could, in some cases, get data into the system because it would download it and that way the kids wouldn't be interrupted if it lost connectivity. They were still getting their data in there and then it would re-upload. I'm not exactly sure, but I know that that was the only way some districts could get right. this done and that's not right. the expectation now that we should be doing. Yeah, it's almost a live sync now, <coughs> which is great in my opinion. It's really uh, cut down on students losing their work. Mm -hmm. The only time when students do work, lose work is if they have a giant essay and they lose the internet in the middle of the essay, you know, so oh, we tell them yeah. to like click next and go back to that, <laughs> and that's going to save it. Mm -hmm. That hasn't happened that I know oh, recently, God. but it is a jinx. Nippon Electric Company, by the way. Okay. It's from Japan, I guess. I never knew that. I yeah. just I had to. Okay, there you go. All right. This is my last slide, so okay. I'll take any other questions. Yes. Can you send this to us? Because I feel like I'm going to have to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for doing that. I know that that was not the initial plan for you to do a presentation, but I, I know based on some of the questions, you wanted to make it very pictorial as well with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Very really detailed. Detailed. Yeah, thank you. This is a very helpful, like when it first came up, I'll be honest, I was like, wow, well, considering everything, but this makes a lot of sense. Well, then I did talk about we could do a tour of a closet room and you know, stuff like that, you know, and do that. Yeah, but we, we decided we could. You're going to have to schedule yeah, exactly. your own mini. <laughs> no, thank you. Do you, want, so do you want to go back? Yeah, can we just run through the whole thing now? Do you want to run through the whole thing? Okay. So thank you so much, Dan. I really appreciate you doing this. You're welcome. I know it was kind of a, you know, Hail Mary pass out there. <laughs> oh, watch out. Oh, no. You're going to rope me in. Just careful. It doesn't get wrapped around your neck. <laughs> No workers comp for that. See what you're trying so, to do. Keith, are you going to plug it back in? <laughs> yeah, so I'm glad. Back yeah, cool. right, I'm just no. making sure we're all on the same page so that we're going back I'll to go, the full budget. I'll go. I'll speed through this. I know it's getting late. Um, so yeah, we're going to. We just talked about the capital budget, um, and we're going to also talk about the um, operating budget. So quick reminder: these are our priority needs. I'm not going to read them. We all know what they are. Operating budget. So. I think it's important to note, you know, for folks at home that we don't always <coughs> recommend exactly what the superintendent recommends, but in this case we are. I feel like most of the years I've been on the school committee, we've pushed back and we've either wanted more or we've wanted to cut, what have you. But this year, um, Dr. Kuska did a great job of making a case for exactly why she wanted um, the budget that she wants. So. We're going to talk about both these things on, on uh, slides coming up, but the, oh, no, too fast. The uh, level services budget, um, which is, you know, just everything that we need to keep exactly what we have from this current year to next year is that second number, that uh, 1.7 plus million. New costs, which we're going to go into detail in a minute, is comes to 109000 for a total budget increase over the current year of 1.9 million. Um, that's a 5.14% increase. And the total budget, as you can see there, um, the budget subcommittee recommendation matches the superintendent's recommendation, which is $39,414. Um, okay, so next slide. So this is what, um, the, we're asking for or what we're recommending um, beyond level services. So these are the new costs from the previous page. The total is 109,000. Um, and you know, just a reminder, Dr. Kuska took us through these. Um, but just a quick reminder that additional school psychologists. We really feel like in talking to Dr. Kuska at length about this, we felt like there really is a solid case for this. Um, we've it's there's just too much work for the number of psychologists we have right now. 
part of that is COVID and, you know, some of the increases we've seen in um, the need for evaluations for IEPs. Um, and some of that was, you know, just the buildup of mental health issues that we were having before COVID and COVID just made it worse. So that's uh, that $83,000 number. Um, we're also recommending the additional 20 hours for an emergent bilingual tutor. Um, this, these services are really needed to meet state guideline, guidelines. Um, and in particular, this is gonna, um, this is specific to Placentino. So over the past three school years, Placentino has seen a significant increase in the um, needs for emergent bilingual students. And last but not least is continue the school-wide use of Seesaw. Helps with homeschool communication, and that's 3,600. Next slide. <laughs> um, so these are uh, a little bit of a breakdown of the budget drivers. This includes those, those new costs. Most of those new costs will be in that first line payroll because most of our new costs um, are the psychologist and the um, emergent bilingual tutor. So as you can see, we're looking at a 4.9% increase in payroll. Um, that's with the new contract. In special education, we're coming in at a 3.6% increase. Everything else, which is um, contracted services like transportation, custodial, software licenses, everything else that's not either um, payroll or special education is seeing a 7.6% increase. Um, and that gives us our total. Okay, next slide. Um, this is our disclaimer. So there are some potential budget drivers that are not included. So, you know, Keith and the administrators did their best to estimate what a level services for next year should look like. But there are a lot of things that, you know, we don't have a crystal ball. Keith doesn't have a crystal ball. So these are some of the issues that are not factored in at this point. Uh, new CBA retiree benefits are um, not budgeted. So I think that means that we, the one, the collective bargaining agreements that we know, the, the people who we know are retiring, or there's some estimate in there, but this just this doesn't factor, doesn't, isn't everybody. Yeah, because the new contract has it, we, the step 14 on the educator's right. contract is now eliminated, but there are different benefits that are harder to estimate because they, they're factoring in how many sick days people have, how many years they've been here, so how much each person gets isn't consistent anymore. And we, I have seen recently a, an increase in people letting me know that they are going to be retiring at the end of next year, so we have to start calculating all this, and some people, you know, we're, it's going to make it harder to estimate because we don't have a standard amount as we did in step 14. Okay. And also, as you can imagine, uh, with the job market and post-COVID, competition for new hires um, could reduce some of our favorability. So, you know, when, when a teacher retires and we hire a replacement, we're generally getting some favorability out of that because a new hire is going to be less than a retiree, but that's, that, that margin could shrink with competition. That's what favorability means. Okay. Um, increase in lane changes are not yet known. We have, as everyone knows, significant increases in the cost of oil and gas. Um, and then there's always the unknowns about special education costs. We have seen out of district placements going up um, post COVID. You know, some of that may be that not everyone wanted to switch schools in the middle of COVID, and some of that may be just the extra mental health issues that we've been talking about and kind of, you know, push some kids out of district. Maybe otherwise we thought it would. Next slide, please. Um, capital budget, we have already talked about $295,000. We voted to um, support the budget, again, that Dr. Cusco recommended. Um, and next slide. <laughs> so hopefully tonight we will vote after a discussion. After that, we make this presentation to um, the Finance Committee next week, March 22nd. Um, They're going to break out abacus? Yes. yes. Excellent. They are. <laughs> um, I'd like to see that. I had fun with that. There's, uh, I, haven't done a, I haven't done a lot of PowerPoint presentations in my life, but um, it's, PowerPoint's gotten a lot better since the last time I used it. Um, 
our public hearing on the proposed budget will be here on April 7th. And then, of course, town meeting has the final say, and that starts on May 9th. Can you, when do we when do we know the lane changes? When what's the time frame? Like June? It's summer. So we've gotten a. I feel like a compared to last year because I haven't been here that long, right? We weren't getting as many request for lane changes because I, I do think COVID put a pause on people taking as many courses and things. So I, it seems like, and you'd have to give me more historical on that, that there's been a significant increase in the amount of um, people that have submitted lane changes and saying, next year I'll be moving to X. Now all of those people will not be moving, but given that rise this year, I'm thinking that Keith has not been able to budget for that increase because he typically has a certain amount set aside, you know, just like we did when we talked about Norfolk Aggie students and things like that. This is not a typical year where we can kind of consistently estimate from year to year. It's, it's becoming unique in many ways, and that's what's making it so hard to foresee some of the things that we, we worry about, that if we cut our budget any lower than our level services, we're not going to be able to make it up when these other things are starting to come out. And particularly, I mean, the, right now, you're all hearing about fuel costs. That's a, a significant concern. He has not added extra money into the budget to deal with that. So at some point, we're going to have to potentially shift resources, even if we get the 5.14%. I can't promise you that we're going to be able to make all this work. We, I mean, truth is, we wanted to absorb some risk as well. I mean, you know, it's it's... Um, and we chose places, it's like we absorb risk in copy paper and copy machines. You know, you all know my spiel on that annually, multiple, multiple times annually. Um, but it's, it's again, we, we added some other areas of risk and because of things that we don't know about. The reason that we did the Norfolk Aggie piece is that we do know there's nine applicants. You know, that, that's a firm number of applicants. Again, we know how, we don't know how many's gonna get accepted and things like that. But that being said, you know, again, the, there's a, there's a significant amount of risk. I don't want to overstate it, but there's a significant amount of risk that we've established in this in this budget proposal already. Yeah, and just for example, because I'm on the chair, I'm the chair for the um, except board uh, as well. They were very worried about their budget because they were seeing a decrease in people um, through the IEP process. People were laying low, for example, because maybe we offered remote last year and different things. So some of that pause, and yes, as Lisa mentioned, some of the increase in trauma-sensitive needs of students is leading to other outside placements. So right now, as my last meeting with uh, the executive director, she has told us that she has seen a significant referrals in that area. So this is not just our district. We're, we're seeing this uptick as well. So I do worry about that, that little bit of a pause that we had with not as many out-of-district requests and needs is now going to start ramping up as well. Go ahead, Stacey. So can you can you go back a couple of slides to the the numbers? No, one more. Again. There you go. Um, I absolutely appreciate the new costs are what appear to be true need and not more of a lofty one. And I appreciate that. But I want to have the conversation about where we fit in the town, right? Because the town um, you know, all the other departments are going through their budget requests as well. And I am concerned. Um, I feel like we're at this critical juncture in, in town where we have got champagne tastes, yet that beer budget, and I wouldn't even call it a beer budget, I'd call it like the really like watered down beer budget. Perhaps blue ribbon. It, whatever. I, I don't drink beer, so I don't know what the worst of the worst My is. The so. cheapest of the cheap is. Um, so I would like to understand the impact to the district if we went with just level service where there are no new costs added. And I'm not saying I'm in favor of that. I want to understand what the impact is because there are some things at the town level that I don't think we should be sacrificing either. Sure, so one of the concerns that I shared with the budget sub was that this was something that was on our list last year. So if you recall when we presented priorities last year, this was also mentioned that we are seeing an increased need for school psychologists. We did ask to push it out to this year. And 
if I were truly going level services, I would just take it off the plate. My worry here is that we currently do not have a high school school, school psychologist, and that high school school psychologist is 80% high school, 20% at Rams, and then Rams shares for the other grade levels with Miller. So the schedules that we have and the unique needs of each building, the time changes and everything else, it's a very inefficient model when we have to have them shift over to buildings and they're only there certain days for certain meetings. And what we're, because of the increase in evaluations and the number of hours each school psychologist has to put into, I think six hours is six what they to eight, Six to eight hours to between doing the testing, yeah. analyzing, and then right And then up. they have yeah. to attend the team meetings. So what we have been told, one of the reasons our, some of our recent hires or even longer term hires left was because they can't keep up with the volume and they were going to other districts or other places where they could keep up. So even with, even before we lost the high school person, we were not keeping up, and then we end up having to contract out some of these services. The other piece is the competition for it. So not only are we down this person, we can't seem to hire right now because these other districts are able to compete. So we've got two strikes against us. By not adding another position, we're having people not want to come for the, old, the position that we already have, and it's really crippling us, and I am worried about how long we can keep up at this rate, even getting outside people through a vendor, incredibly expensive, but they're not even able to find someone for us. And they don't know our, our programs. School psychologists in the district are able to make recommendations based on the programs that we have. Sometimes you see some, when you do independent evaluations, they don't align with what the district is able to offer. And yes, while we're supposed to individualize the students, if you don't know the program, sometimes you're making requests that just don't even make sense for the, the alignment of our schools. So I am very worried long term if we cannot address this issue both to maintain staff and then also just to deal with the volume evaluation that keep up. So otherwise we'll be out of compliance and that's going to cost us compensatory services as well. In, are there, sorry, can I just follow up yeah, on that? Sorry. Are there, can we make efficiencies elsewhere? You've talked about some um, curriculum alignments and leadership alignments, are there places where there can be some efficiency made to the budget? For the curriculum uh, work that I'm, I'm trying to put together a proposal on that, we do have a specific number of FTEs that are in the contract and we also have stipend positions that are contractual that we are obligated to continue so that I can't eliminate those. What my hope would be is to try to change some of the reorganization around to make more efficiencies, but it would be a cost-neutral proposal, which is what I proposed in the priority needs. So at the end, might be we see some small amount of stipends eliminated, but when I say small amount, I'm talking $10,000. I mean, I haven't calculated all because I haven't come up with a plan yet, something I have to work on, but we're not, we're not finding a position with any of that. It's a very small amount, if any, that would come up. Amanda? And then I'll take that. So my question is sort of similar, and bear with me because this is my first time going through a budget process, but um, as far as taking money from the other parts of town, after hearing what happened at the select board and talking to Mark Frank and folks from other boards and stuff, I know that there's been an extensive like reorganization taking place with like facilities, the highway department, parks and rec. I don't really care about them because right now I'm a school committee member, so I just want to talk about what affects us as a, as a school system. Um, but I do think there could be effects in that um, sort of a domino effect from money that's from these other boards that are now not going to like a giant project that's ready to go at Goodwill, which would involve like tennis courts, which I know we use with our high school team, stuff like that. And then the next is Stoddard, building a baseball diamond and all that stuff. Keith, you probably know more about that. Like we would be able to use that because um, we have problems with our field. So it does have an impact on the school committee. But that aside, the thing I'm more concerned about is with um, this kind of this kind of stuff that these boards are planning, as well as like people wanting like the new police officer in town and all these other um, expenses, I've heard that there's been talk of requesting a small override, not from us, but from elsewhere in the town. Is this like something that maybe came out at the select board or something? People were talking about it would be a small override, as to, from what I'm understanding. 
the problem is I think this affects us a lot because we all know that perhaps a few years down the line we are going to be asking for an override for a new high school. And I know an override is something that you really can only ask for every once in a while and you have to really pick and choose as to when you need it the very most. And I'm worried that if not by our fault, but just some sort of circumstances in the town, we'd take all the money from these other spots in town who would then need to re request an override would really, really hurt us down the line asking for a much larger override that we would need for a new high school. So this is all just food for thought. That being said, I would never say that any of this is more important or takes precedence over the need for a new school psychologist or um, the cameras in the high school and middle school. And hearing from Dan um, with the technology piece, it sounds like if that's not an absolute disaster waiting to happen, it will be very soon. And not doing that would just be kicking the can down the road. So I guess my question as a new member of the school committee is similar to Stacy's. I just don't know what the budget subcommittee, sort of the work that you're doing, are we to assume that nothing else at all can be tightened or gotten rid of? Like, could we get rid of Freckle? Are there other programs, technology-wise, that we, we used in COVID, STAR assessment? Yeah, like, I, don't I don't think know. we're getting Freckle. I mean, I, that was a pilot situation, that's so correct. it doesn't appear that we're going to be going in that direction, so that's not even... Did you want to answer that, Lisa? Yeah. Okay. Well, Lisa, so one thing to keep in mind is that when, you're, when we're thinking about capital and operating, two totally different buckets. Yeah. yeah. So. The capital money, you know, spending money on technology upgrades is not taking away from a new psychologist, for example, right. or anything else that would be operating for another town department. Um, I think the most important thing you said is that we're here to advocate for the schools. That's our job. That's what we're elected to do. So um, I think that we're, we're, as a budget subcommittee, and you guys can interject if you feel differently, but I think why we were comfortable with going with this recommendation is largely because there are still so many unknowns. So if we cut this back at all, and then, you know, oil and gas kills us, or, you know, there's some other you know, one out of district placement that, you know, we're not budgeted for, we're, we're just not going to have any wiggle room. And I think that, you know, it's, I'm hopeful that this will work exactly as intended and we'll get the new psychologist, but I'd be extremely concerned about going only with level services because of all the unknowns that we listed. And there are a lot more unknowns, and this is not a normal year. There, I mean, there are always unknowns, but they were sort of like a little more predictable. They fell within, I mean, Keith can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but they seem to fall within a tighter range pre-COVID, and now it just feels like, you know, it, it's a little harder to predict. Yeah. So, so am I right fair? interpreting? Yours, I'm saying let's tighten it, com let's compress and compress all that we can, these little details a little bit here and a little bit there, and you're saying That's we, may have to, we may have to do that if all of these unknowns happen. But we're not there yet, and so right. let's 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 hope I'll for the best. I'll answer even more directly. So we got a line item budget yeah. from Keith. Okay. We are looking through everything as a budget subcommittee, and we are if we get to the point where you know cuts have to be made, we know what's in there. Okay. So we don't. That we are comfortable good. with the level of. It, it, if this is approved, we are comfortable with where that all works out in the total package. Can I just speak to the favorability piece? Because this is where, because I've been doing hiring a long time in my various roles, and I tend to be very conservative as far as what I potentially offer, because it's negotiable based on experience and so forth. There are criteria I have to follow. But certain positions are easier to hire than others so you typically are able to hire low in some positions and there are some that are unique and you have to you're not going to get someone coming in low so every year when you see five ten maybe less depends on the year people retire and if they're retiring at the top step when we budget for the next year we're thinking well usually we can try to think no higher than let's say a master step five ish or sometimes even lower 
and I'm usually very good at offsetting the budget when I've had to do all the hiring to be able to say, okay, we don't know for sure, but there's usually going to be a little bit of that favorability left over. So when we have unforeseen emergencies, which is why he doesn't have to budget so tight for unforeseen costs like gas and things, because it's usually that little, it's not like you have lots of money left over. But there's, you have to have a little bit. Yeah. You don't know, it, it doesn't always work out. But right now, every position that I've seen coming in has come in higher than ever expected. And even when I offered out of my comfort level, because I knew we were in a dire straits, for example, we just tried to rehire the school psychologist at the high school, even though that person, I was able, I went to a higher level of uh, finances, that person still did not accept the position. So that's where I'm saying I, I can't count on any of that money being able to offset any of these unforeseen emergencies, which you do in a normal year, and I don't see that going away for at least the next two or three years. The competition is stringent. Mm -hmm. um, I hear of one district right now in, in, the, in the area that may do some reductions, which maybe they'll have some people looking for jobs, but in most cases, people are know that they can shop around, which is, it's completely unique and COVID has created this bubble. And, and, and just one more thing, I just want to for Amanda's uh, uh, comments there too, is you, the thing you have to remember is that this is not the last time you're going to make a decision on right. this budget. Yeah, that's you know, there's seven weeks or so to, to town meeting. I mean, this is a process and, and you know, kind of respect the process. And because and, once you go down, it's very difficult to go back up. And I'm not saying we've shot up high for a reason. We've taken risks in certain areas that we feel we have either both the reason to take the risk or or place that we can absorb the risk, but other places we don't feel we can. And so it's it's balancing those things out. You know, I again I will say that this if if the voted if the school committee's recommendation I honestly can't remember a single year that the school committee's first recommendation, recommended budget ended up being the final number. And, it's, and, and I'm being fair about this. And a couple times it's gone up, most of the times it still trickles down, even if it's just a little bit. Because again, everybody wants to meet it. Everybody understands the importance of schools to this community. There's no question about that. But the, 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 the challenge that we have is the timing of things. It doesn't always fall in our way. We don't know how many teachers are going to take a job in another district. We don't know how many or teachers when. are going to leave at the end of this year and not tell us till you know, June 22nd. You know, it, it's those sorts of things. We don't know what family may move into town that we now own an out-of-district placement for. There's all of these pieces that, again, it's very fluid for us, um, and I know it's, at times it feels very static for you, um, but these are things that, you know, we live daily, you know, and th that's the one point I want to make. And then the second point I want to make is every time, if, do anybody notice that every time Susan said emergency, she pointed at me? <laughs> just want well, to well, make sure we got that. I just want Don. Don yeah. waiting. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank Thanks. you, everybody. So I did want to assure you that when budget subcommittee, we did receive like a detailed list, which encompasses about five pages. There's about 12 items per page, breaking down everything from business and finance to human resource and benefits to legal services to admin technology curriculum. I mean, I can keep going on. And then underneath it, it breaks it down further, and it's what was appropriate for FY22, um, what's recommended for FY23, the delta, the increase, the decrease, the percentage, and then we could go through, we went through and asked, well, what's driving that? What is that? Why is that higher or lower? How, why did that jump so much? Where did that come from? So what we've presented, I feel strongly, is a lean budget in a difficult time. We are, we are just, we've just crossed that two year anniversary and we all have kids who've been in the school system during this time and we know how difficult it's been. But we also know that in terms of federal funding and extra state funding, you know, we're, we're running away from that. So I, what I see is a lean budget in a difficult time. We're asking for less than one third of 1% increase. And here's why I think it is so incredibly important. That school psychologist um, that Dr. Kuska is asking for comes at a cost of $83,295. We asked, what if we don't have it? And the students still have needs, and they do. We've seen that this year. And we also, to you know, the point that was spoken tonight, we do think that some of these requests for out-of-district placements and assessments may have been delayed because of the pandemic or increased students' needs, and now we'll have more students being assessed. So what happens if we don't have that psychologist? 
we're still required to do those assessments and help those kids, but we have to contract out for it. Okay, what's the rate for that? Let's average what the rate is and multiplying it out, if that person worked only 30 hours a week for only 30 weeks, that's already 135,000. So in my mind, if we don't bring on board someone at a cost of 83,000, we may actually run a deficit into our budget and have to yeah. make cuts to, to get to, you know, to be able to provide students with what we're legally mandated to provide. The ELA tutor. Can um, I just speak to one, one part of that, the psychologist also? That, that person knows our systems and knows each of the student knows the students and knows the administration. So that's, that's oh yeah, you're so, the choir. So, right, so like it, it's also a one, matter sure. of a, a continuity of care as well. So that's a huge piece of that too. And and from my understanding, the school psychologist at um, having the fourth one is a restoration, Keith, from many years ago. So we have been trying to claw, crawl back to having something that we've had in the past. And back this, from, this, this won't even get us this, back to where we no, were. No, no, we're before still before I got on yes. So <laughs> it's been it's been a year since we had to cut that position yes. and haven't been able to pull it back. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to make that point. And during a time when we have a compelling need for it. I mean, maybe five years ago we needed it, but we really need it at this point. And the ELA tutor, again, I mean, it's just, it's the population that we have and the services that we're required to provide. So I see this as a, a lean level services budget, and these are absolute essential needs of, of less than one third of one percent. And I am incredibly concerned that if we do not support this, that we have to cut the money from somewhere. And so in going through that, that budget of more than 60 different items and then the subcategories under them, I am a bit concerned. I mean, think about fuel costs and what you've read in like the Wall Street Journal this week and the percentage increase. You know, we asked the, uh, the projections for fuel costs that are in this budget are projections from November. I mean, we're hearing stories about your electricity bill could go up by 30 or 40 percent. If that happens, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. So this budget is bearing risk, in fairness. Yeah, and it makes me feel a lot better that the three of you and all of you have sat down and really picked over it. So that's great to hear. Um, I just, one follow-up question. It sounds like what you're saying is that the new costs, the school psychologist particularly, would have to be the first thing to go. And I agree that that is a giant need. and. Perhaps I would rank that like number one. So like, why would that be the thing? Because it's new. Because right. it's new. I can't get that to lay off people yeah. that are right. existing that we already have a need for. Even though I have a need for this new position, I would very struggle with trying to lay off people that to we already need mm -hmm. enrollment-wise, and we'll present on that another time. So it's it's. It's worrisome. Right. So just to, I just wanted to make one more point. Um, the other issue that I think we also need to consider to Stacy's point about the town's needs is that we've reviewed over, and you, you've got a copy also of the town's budget from the town administrator, from every line, from every committee, and the majority, the vast majority of them are looking at level service. So you know, that may mean that we have to end up cutting those in the end. But we're, we're presenting our best foot forward, and we're going to, we, this is just our first, you know, stab at this. We are going to meet with the Finance Committee, and the Finance Committee may not recommend that the, we, or, or they may not say, we don't have that ability to give you what you're asking for. Because like us, all the other you know, committees and boards are dealing with the same kinds of issues that the pandemic has brought. So their budgets are also elevated at a level two. So I just, it's more of like a just preparing for where we're where we're okay. moving in this. It's not a. I'm not trying to be doomsday, but I'm just trying to no, that's prepare to that. Like yeah. there's and there's a lot of other moving parts that we still have to look at. So those Norfolk Aggie students, we may know more about who's actually going to be going by mid-April, and that may shift some things around that that help us or not. But you know we have to keep looking at those things. So we may be coming up to the wire in terms of making adjustments to our budget, and we can do that up until town meeting. <coughs> so okay. Mary, go ahead. So um, when we are talking, so we already have a lean budget. Um, Stacy talked about some sacrifices that would need to be made if we were to recommend this budget. Finance committee, I'm not sure where they are with, with, with recommending this budget. If we had to pare down the already lean budget, where are we hitting in priority list? That's like, a great question. So unless I knew the number that, that we were ending up at, I can't give you any definitive things, but it's, Amanda already alluded to, if we are looking at a level services budget, then 
right off the bat the ELL tutor and the school psychologist is off the plate, right? I still don't know that we would be able to meet compliance for all the ELL students because we've had a significant increase, particularly at Placentino, which is why uh, that position was, but it's, it's really not a want. It's, neither of these are a want. In fact, mm -hmm. the principals probably weren't that happy with me when they came with their list of other needs because I didn't even have them present them to you. We as a group agreed that we couldn't even, in the, where we are in the, <coughs> the budget and with the contracts that were settled late that we are now retroactively dealing with and Mr. Bidet is going to have better numbers on that. We haven't even factored all of that in to tell you we're going to end up this year and that compounded the next year. And that is why I just presented those bare bones needs to you. So those will be gone. I, you know, we will figure it out somehow or we might have to shift something else around. But if we were going below level services, you know, just for example, if you look at just a bachelor step two teacher, you're talking about 200,000 we would have to decrease to get from the 4.85 to, uh, I think what we talked about one point, a 4.35 was showing on the town's budget at one mm -hmm. point. So that's about 200,000. Is that an exorbitant amount of money? No, but it's the equivalent of potentially four teachers on the lower end of the scale, on the bottom end of the scale. If you're looking at paraprofessionals, you're looking at eight to 10 paraprofessionals. Now, clearly, you're looking at all positions and trying to balance this out, so it wouldn't come from one bucket. We'd have to look at what are the most stringent needs, and where can we reduce a little bit here and a little bit there. But as far as paraprofessionals, most of the ones that we have are tied to IEPs, except for a small amount who are half-day kindergarten paras. So we've already given up on that. We don't even have kindergarten paras in the full day. They were only there for half the day, even though now all of our students are full day. That's something in the future when we restore to a more positive environment, I would be asking to build in full-time paras, but that is a want right now, not a, a fair necessity, which is why we haven't even talked about those kinds of things. So no matter how it's, it's looking to come up with 200,000, um, you know, people have talked about ARPA funds and different grant funds, and we've been fortunate that the town has given us funds to offset our kindergarten this year and going into next year, but we are also, we have also put aside our ESSER two and three funds to specifically to offset kindergarten. And some districts have offset personnel with that. It's not a good idea because it doesn't it doesn't get to your bottom line. It doesn't build into the operating It's a one-time fund, so we have been very careful to try not to fund positions that we would then have to cut once the money runs out. But we strategically are using that money specifically to build equity for kindergarten, and I stand by that proposal. But that means I don't even have those one-time funds to offset mm -hmm. at this point. Because we're because they've already been encumbered for that use. We, exclusively. We also discussed in budget using one-time funds to try and um, pay someone for a position in a competitive job market is not sustainable, right? As soon, you know, it, it'd be unlikely to come here if they knew it was just for one year. Right, they knew it was or, almost or grant, grant or earmarked or grant funded right, as right. well, so same thing. Stacey, but Susan, ahead. can you elaborate, so if we end up at level service and we become out of compliance with ELL or even with special ed with the psychologist, then what happens? So we need to hire people, like hire con you know, contract services. So then what happens when we go over budget? <laughs> Keith, you want to address that? Because I'm not sure, like I don't think we've ever experienced it that I've been on the committee. I just want to, like what does that look like? And this is where sometimes favorability solves that problem for right. you. And that's the one thing I cannot count on in this class. Right. That's, so what, I'm saying that's right. what no right. copy paper though. for anybody yeah. and no copy. We'd have to cut somewhere. It would just be what is the so least start least start. impactful at that point. Uh, I, so I mean, it, de it depends on the degree with which we would be in trouble. Mm -hmm. Certain levels we do have other resources, whether it be something like a circuit breaker account, you know, so balances within our school choice or our tuition accounts that we can go against. So there are places we can go to remedy these things. But again, it's not a permanent solution. Mm -hmm. And you certainly don't want to be, if the need is there, okay, for say a school psychologist, if the need is there mm -hmm. to fill it with contractors that you know are going to lead you to a bad place yeah. is just, it's it just doesn't make sense. I mean, it, it's you know, and that's that's the difficulty with this is that you know, we know right now that even with the three when all three were here, we were teetering at that level of maybe we need to bring somebody in to help us with this, and it's, it was teetering at that level. Bringing in another rookie 
to fill the one vacancy now is going to put us at that level again, if not over it, much less with potentially more and more people needing, you know, referral services that are going to require testing, that are going to require, you know, boom, you know, just it's a, it's a domino effect yeah. on cost. And it's not even our referrals; it's also just the people that are already on IEPs. Right. It's every three, three years year they need to be evaluated. Yep. So those yep. are already in district happening. Right. So Which and that's the level we're at. So you add a right. few new ones to that, and you end up, you know, new, a few new referrals on top of that, and you're over. Um, I know. So what's irritating me is the seesaw on there for thirty six hundred dollars. <laughs> so part of me wants to just write you a check and call it a day. But is it on there and operating? Be why? Why is it under the operating budget? Because it, it was a, it was a specific request that came through um, the the priority needs presentation. So it just floated in that way. Obviously, that's not going to the dollar volume there. When you talk about a thirty-nine million dollar request, is you know again, it's, it's, it's it, it, we, as we keep talking about, we have to get the level so services. Like, the reason it's there is because it was related to COVID. It wasn't in the initial budget. Right. 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 Absolutely. Right. Um, Why would it so, fall under capital though? Yeah, I know because it's, it's a, because it's an annual it's an annual it's license. Annual license. You have to write me a check every it's year. It's software, not, <laughs> yeah. It's software, I know. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, Even after you leave town. I don't know if anybody has this question, but my question would be, if, we're, if basically we're saying that the psychologist is a requirement to be in compliance and ELL is required to be, to be in compliance and our budget doesn't, if we're not able to get the level services, we still need those anyway. So we may have to make cuts whether we, we like it or not. We still may have to cut. Yes. I just want to make well, that clear. I was, that, that that was because if this, these are things that we have to be in compliance with, so they're basically like, you know, Massachusetts law will say you're out of compliance, you must have these. Right. Then we may end up having to make cuts at level service or because we need those positions. Yes. So, so they may be rolled into the level service and then we might still have to make cuts. Yeah. To so make when that work. We, we are talking about cuts, we are talking about lower level teachers, parents. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to presume we are because we'd have to look at everything and right. meeting with the principals to talk strategically about that. But. Yes, if you end up look, just looking at seniority, if you, if you do cut positions, you can't cut one high position to offset. You end up, you have to cut by seniority, so you have to look at the lower pay, which means more bodies and more. But it also, might it also mean not rehiring for a position, not refilling for someone who is retiring? That and, could happen. And then, again, instead of a teacher getting cut, a program is getting cut. Fair or enough. Something like could, that. There's all, like, everything course. would be on the table, yeah. but then it's but a matter not, of. We're not that point. Okay. Yeah. But we're not there yet. Yeah. It's Don't. a matter of, though, if you're looking <laughs> at it, if we have a math opening and someone retires, but we still have all those kids going to that mat like right I mean, the finance committee could come back and say be at six percent we're good just historically two years ago at this time we voted a budget of four point seven three seven three percent mm -hmm. and then we ended up with a budget of zero point five five percent so two years ago that was where we were and that's getting yeah. us now because and now right and it has a snowball effect Correct. and then last year we at town meeting we were approved for a budget of five point five seven five point yeah. five seven I know you're all so our five point one myself. four is a deal next to five point <laughs> five seven <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure it's going to that way so that's yes. a good that's a good way to present it. Let me say one more thing. I know okay. this is like the, I, I'm be very careful about how I put this. I'll talk. I'll think before I talk. But not for nothing. But we have worked really hard to hold the line on expenses, and one of the ways we did that was by spending a lot of time negotiating the teachers' contract. And this isn't to say that we don't, we, we, we were accused that we were doing that because we don't value our teachers. We did that because it's the lion's share of our budget. Yeah. And so we worked, you know, really hard to be fiscally conservative on responsible. that. Responsible. And we did Sorry. fiscally responsible. An and, and we did the best that we could. And I think where we ended up is fair. I think it's fair to the town. I think it's fair to the teachers. I think that, you know, hallelujah that that is done, but, you know, we, that was painful, you know, that was painful for everyone. It was painful for the teachers and the school committee. So, but we did that because we take 
our financial responsibilities very seriously, and we tried to put the emotions aside and focus on, you know, being careful with money. And so this could, I mean, you know, this is a lean budget. Mm -hmm. When you when you look at how hard that, that we have worked to, you know, be fiscally responsible, I think this is a very fair budget. And unless we forget that our population, I'm sorry, our budget comes from the revenue that we get in our town. And the revenue from our town is 86% from a residential tax base. That's it. Right. That's it. 86%. And that's even better than it used to be. It used to be 87.5. So we have, you know, that's where it comes from. So yeah, if we want it, we have drives. to pay for it ourselves. We don't have the industry in town currently to support it any other way. And we're, we're still working on that, but it, we're not there yet. And I don't know if we ever will be. We might turn away all these things, but that means we have to pay for it somewhere. So to your point about an override, an operational override of some sort. But yeah, and then schools. I'm not sure that we're at that point either, but it, it's definitely being floated around as something that we might have to consider. Sure. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not going to speak to override specifically, but just if there were ever a consideration of that, you're looking not in May, right? Right. So that doesn't, schools can't fund that way. Yeah. I have to, and in June, I'd have to find out where am I in June. So mm -hmm. even if, let's just say, something went forward at the town level for October, I can't hire people. I have to reduce people in right. June. So even if the town had additional money in October, it doesn't really do me any good because I can't open school around that. We can't operate in a negative budget, period. Okay. It's there. <laughs> John's moving forward. Um, yeah, so I, I guess if, if we're all done with discussion at this point, I'd entertain a motion to approve the um, school committee operating budget um, at $39,004,314 to be presented to the Finance Committee on March 22nd, which is next Tuesday. Is that moved by Don? Moved by Don, second by Catherine. Moved by Don, second by Catherine. All in favor? Thank you. And we should also do the same motion for the capital budget. Can you put that slide up? I don't yep. know what the number is. I'll, oh, it's just 20, it's just 295, right? 295. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm out of control. What are you doing? <laughs> it's not my presentation. I don't know what it is. There so, it is. I, yeah, so I'd entertain a motion to approve our well, total capital. Can we capital? talk about it first? Oh, sure. sure. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you, I, did, I thought we were yeah, done with I, that discussion. I am technology. I, I, that was excellent. I get it. I'm, I'm with Dan. I'm not sure where I am on the indoor cameras, and I really feel like there is a contingent of community members who also may not think that this is the right avenue for us. I'm wondering if we hold off on that until fall. Um, I really want it thought out. I want to understand how it's going to work. Because quite honestly, kids have been writing on bathroom walls probably since caveman times. And I really feel like I want to understand what the consequences are for, for her student. Like, I, I want to see the whole picture. I feel like this is a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction to specifically this fall, and I understand being feeling like this fall was really a, a, for lack of a better word, really traumatic for the entire district. I'm struggling with this a little bit. I don't know if it's the right thing. I know it's only $20,000, but I, I feel like we need to think about this more and really talk through it. Can I just say one thing about the, so this is the school committee's prerogative to vote this or not, that is your, vote is toward the budget. I'm not going to follow my sword over this. However, I will say it is not specifically related to the hate speech incidents. One of the things we did see when there were some TikTok videos that went out and students were encouraged to do silly things like clogging toilets, breaking sinks. I mean, there were significant costs and efficiencies. They had to close how many bathrooms? I mean, they literally had to lock bathrooms. So, so I don't want to isolate this to one incident. It's most high schools and middle schools are being built with this. Like I said, 20-something years ago, it was in my own schools in my own town. So 
it's not unique. It, it is unique not to have these things as a preventative measure. I also relate to the hate speech. Yes, part of that is this equation. Listening to some of the students who felt like some of our marginalized students who were the focus of some of this hate speech said things to me like, why is nothing being done? That's what it looks like to some people, that we don't care about preventing some of these things from happening. So I do believe if we had had these things in place, we probably would not have. We may have had some incidences. I do not believe we would have had seven in a short amount of time. And I do not believe we would have had, I don't know how many. Do you have any idea how many of the vandalism at the middle school happened? Probably in excess it was, of the $20,000. Well, the middle school, was, yeah, middle school was significant damage was consistently. Insane. And I, I hate to say it, but we closed down bathrooms. And then students, I hate now, we're affecting their bodily yeah, functions. Course, you know, right. so. But are there other ways to prevent it, I guess, is what I'm getting at, too? Hire more staff to monitor? I mean, really, that's it's, the only way. I think it's more costly to hire somebody to sit outside of the bathroom and more intrusive. I think it has a deterrent effect, which is why we've seen almost so many other school districts go to it. I mean, even before we had the vandalism and the hate speech, um, and I think we pro many of us know this, the middle school and the high school, there's often, you know, many bathrooms that are locked, right? And if you are a girl with five minutes to get from one end of this building to another, and the first three bathrooms you, pa you pass are locked, it's a bummer. I think this could really help with that. It would deter some of the, we, we just don't have the staff, which is why at our middle school, I mean, we all know this, our, our two highest paid administrators in the building are the lunch monitors, right? Because we don't have bathroom monitors, and we don't have people to monitor the hallways like some school districts do. And so I see this as $20,000 serving about 16 to 1,700 kids probably for the next 10 years or more. Um, but I'm not even suggesting staff, Don. I think there are other ways, like... I think kids really, kids don't see consequences for their actions. But we'd have to find out who it is to give consequences. I mean, that's just it. Our administrators, I can't tell you how many hours they spent investigating these. They took it very seriously. If they can't find who did it, how can you apply consequences? And kids don't want to rat each other out. So even if they know, they weren't coming. Now, that is something with safe and supportive schools that we need to work on, not being a bystander. So long term. We're trying to get people to understand that by saying nothing, you are complicit in this, and that is part of the education. But it's going to take a long time, and you're not going to you're not going to solve that. That was one of the reasons why I wanted David and Nicole to come to speak to it, because I similarly with Stacey, I was feeling the same way. Like, why can't we just take the doors off? Why, you know, do they really need this as, as a, to help them to address these issues or not? So. I'm trying to get both of them. I just time wanted to say because my, the school I work at has these cameras, and I'll just to say what our experience has been like. Um, every time the fire drills is pulled, we catch the kid immediately. There have always been consequences for these things. This, the the acts, like you said, people have been writing on the bathroom walls for years. Nothing is new. It's just much easier for the administrators um, to find out who did it. Find out who did it. Um, as far as some parent concerns that I've heard about privacy and that kind of thing, it's not in the classrooms. No one's learning or behavior is being yeah. occupied. It's not in the bathrooms. So it's really, I've never heard one complaint at my school about it being intrusive or anything like that. It's really only for safety. And if you think about it, like it really is kind of a safety issue in my mind, like both as a deterrent and not, but like it's preventing kids from selling weed in the hallways because there's a camera there, or if someone is, like, it's caught on tape. Like, it's not, and no one sees it. Like, Dr. Cusk is not going to be sitting there being like, oh, my gosh, look at this kid's bad behavior. It's more just, like, in an emergency situation, it will help solve that yeah, We don't have staff to sit there monitoring these cameras. We would right. only look at them it's as passive. needed in a survey. Right. Yeah. And if there is a report that something happened, we, you can actually go by and see in real where time. and yeah. in real time, and I think that's very helpful. That's definitely right. And I think I think we're a little bit behind by not having them, as far as being like a state of the art competitive school. I think most schools have them. And the SEL part of it as well. I think that really makes it tie together because safe and supportive without knowing who to actually go to when you have give consequences is, I think, a big, big deal. It, no, no new school building that's being built anywhere does not have them. I mean, they're, they're, they're just integrated into all new models, so, and even a lot of older buildings have added them because they just become kind of the norm. Catherine? 
I was just going to say, um, you know, we're talking about vandalism and toilets getting clogged, things like that. But there's bigger safety issues that these could really help with. And there was a school shooting in Boston just last week, you know, and these are things that in, in really dire straits could come in really handy to know who's entering a building from what angle. You know, I, I feel like I, I agree with all of the safety issues you're talking about, but and in those darkest of times, it would be really nice to have a camera in the hallway. One thing I was going to ask, as we if if we do um, if this if we do vote in favor of this and it moves forward, I know you know in a perfect world we'd be asking for a lot more because it would cover many more cameras, many more hallways. Again, this is lean maybe also consider decoys, right? Because we've, you know, I think um, David Jordan and Nicole talked to, to the fact that it's a deterrent. So to the extent we can also build in, you know, cover more areas with decoys as well. Yeah, and I think the only reason, Keith, you, you can speak better, but the reason that it is such a small amount is because we'd be able to add it to our existing system. Yeah, it, it's oh, basically right. just adding the camera. It, it, it would be an add-on to the um, existing system. So we already have the server, we already have the software. There's literally just somebody to come in here, you know, take the camera we buy, connect it, and call it a day. Because these so. systems can be. We already have the surveillance yes. closet right. or wherever it is. And then would, would it also be in the libraries or just the hallways? Just the hallways. Because yeah, yes. this, is, this is really a class class setting. Space. We're not. Yeah. Oh. And students are supervising here. We have adults, and, you know, they, we can't supervise every minute in the hallway when adults are in the classroom. So uh, it's down the line, but when we get a new high school, uh, you are saying it's in bed, so these cameras can be repurposed to other buildings? I can't promise you that, just because when you build a new high school, they're going to be ramping everything, so. It may not be worth tearing them out, in all honesty, because you'd be dealing with a, so if we start working on a new high school in eight years, I was gonna you say, know, it's probably going to be another you know, it's it's be before we even, you know, so you know so that's, that's. And you have a 10 years of life. If that. Oh, yeah. Okay. I just want to throw it out there that um, in the debate of safety, not this budget, but like next year, maybe I would be in favor of putting them in Miller and Constantino as well, like in the near the doorways to, you know, not necessarily in the hallways. The problems there are different, but in terms of safety and knowing who's coming and who's going, and I've said this in other meetings before that the Ability of people moving in and out of the buildings, I think, is something that it needs to be addressed long term. Um, and I can I tell you a story that I just remembered. I was at one of my coach meetings on Monday, and I was speaking with the Milton superintendent and talking about these topics. And he said to me, somehow there was they had an they had an extracurricular event up at school. And the custodian was seeing someone. It was after school hours, but someone was wandering around the building. And the custodian said, can I help you? What do you, you could see this gentleman like going up and down the stairs. He's like, you must be in the wrong place of the building. So he reported that to administration. The superintendent or principal went on to the cameras. They have a picture of this person. This per I don't know what he did not. They don't know what this person's intent was, but they have a visual person. He was appeared to be up to no good, wandering their hallways for some length of time. Yeah. So I think that's scary. That person, if anything did happen, would have been caught by the police. Because you know what I mean. So those are things that happen. I hate to say it, we don't want to be Sandy Hook. We don't. But Holliston is just as possible to happen here as any other place. I mean, I hate to believe that we're in these times, but I mean, it's the reality of the times we live in. Good, good things or bad things happen in good districts. But. I was not proposing at the elementary schools yet, but this was an elementary building where the superintendent was talking to me. He said, I have, he showed me the video footage, and this person was clear as day on the screen. Well, and like, you know, not now because of the times, but on the weekends, there's basketball, there's, you know, the buildings are open in the evenings for different kind of yeah. like extended day kids, and they're very late. Like, you know, it's, it's not just the high school, middle school that need. Which is why we're looking for other potential capital projects in the future of FOBs and different things that we're trying to look into for. So how much would it be additional? I know we are not adding anything, but I'm just curious, like, 
to add to elementary schools, how much would it increase the budget? Would it not have made sense to do it at the same time, just as the technology piece is getting done? I wasn't hearing from the principals that they feel it is much of a need. Yeah. I haven't seen the incidences or, or, or types of incidences, but the types of things of preventative, like both Catherine and I were talking about, that's, we haven't had those yet. And, the, and students are, are more supervised. They, there's less. There's nobody wandering the hallway. I was going to say, I don't think really roaming around They're like not. They're, they're like, you know, but I mean, it, it is. Yeah, students students right. at the older grades have more yeah. autonomy at different yeah, times of the day. They're led from, they're 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 led from place to place. But in the future, yes, I can't right. foresee like, coming back. Like uh, so keeping the safety in mind, would the doorways being monitored would not make sense? Or do they have cameras already outside? At the, at the entrances, we have buzzer systems and cameras at each oh, door. Mm -hmm. yeah. At the main doors. Okay. okay. Okay, um, I would entertain a motion to approve the total capital request at $295,000 for indoor cameras and technology infrastructure as outlined by Mr. McLeod. Do I have a motion? Moved by Lisa. Moved by Lisa. Seconded by Catherine. Seconded by Catherine. All in favor? That carries. Great. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair? Yes, ma'am. It's almost 10 o'clock. Is there anything on our agenda that we can push off to a future meeting? Um, I, was, I was thinking of that. I, I definitely, I'm sorry, Catherine, I'm going to kick your policy to the oh, next. But I know you're devastated. I actually have a lot of notes for you, so it'll probably be helpful. Um, let's see. We do not have a newsletter. Don, is that correct? No, we will have one after we meet with um, FinCom. Well, we wanted to vote the budget and yes. tonight, and okay. then also have our meeting with FinCom, and then we'll be prepared to have a newsletter um, at our next meeting in two okay. weeks, which will be in advance. Three, but oh. we, we may we may schedule another one. Our next meeting is April seventh, so it's not the thirty first. Oh, I thought it was no. the thirty first. No, okay. that would have been third three meetings in this month, so no. Okay. But we doesn't mean we won't if we have, we may need to, depending on the outcome of our meeting next week. So maybe I should prep you guys for that. We might have to have another meeting. Oh, on you the should prep us I'll because I have, okay. okay. On the 31st? <laughs> so on the 31st, we may need to have another meeting. The 31st. Two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. Sorry, two weeks. Because sure. sure. our next meeting is supposed to be April 7th, and we may need to, prior to our hearing, our public hearing, if we need to make adjustments to the budget, we'll need to vote on that. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Yes. So, um, so keep an eye on that space on the 31st. So, to be um, we have not scheduled office hours. Lisa, do you want to talk? She's communications. Oh, oh, fair enough. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on when communications. Do office hours. So office hours. Yeah. When do you want to do office hours, Don? No. I think that we need to probably break it up and yeah. Okay. Like, okay. I think it's fair that Saturdays, Sundays. All right. Let's Saturday. let's put a bit, let us put, put a pin on that. And let's just go through the rest of okay. the um, subcommittee. Um, we'll we'll go back to the calendar in a second. Um, policy. Do you guys have a next meeting scheduled? Yeah, we do not. Okay, so we'll review over the policies that we had on for tonight. Thank you so much for putting them on. We'll just put them on for the next time. <laughs> um, and I do have a bunch of notes, so I'll get back to you before that so that maybe they'll, it'll save us some time. Let's put it that way. Because okay. I had a lot of questions. Okay. Um, budget, we are already, I'm not going to even get into it. We, yeah, we, we, need to, we should probably schedule a budget so you guys don't need now for later next week. Okay. Um, do it after. You can do it offline. Okay. Okay. Um, superintendent's evaluation, do you have a meeting scheduled? Stacey. No. Yeah. No, we won't be meeting until we get feedback from my Okay. After the April 7th, right, Stacey? That's what we decided. Right. It won't be until after April 7th. Okay. So I'm not worried about that. All right. Uh, should I miss anything on the phone? No. Okay. Um, so let's go to um, Dr. Kuska's very quick superintendent's update, like super, super quick. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow, that was yeah. <laughs> okay, and then Mr. McBoudet, you have a financial update for us? Um, no, I don't because with the, I just wanted to say, and, Su and you know, Susan mentioned earlier with the fact that we have two new contracts that we still haven't been able to complete because the complexities with um, one of the contracts doing the retro, I tried to put it together and I just, I'll be honest, I didn't like the numbers. And it's not that they were bad. I just had no confidence in the, what I was going to project for the paraprofessionals and for the teachers. So I, I'm, okay. I'm hunting. So, but what about the other, like the FY23 budget detail? Do we have that? Should we? 
you said no. <laughs> nothing. No, the line. It's not the, we'll the line. That budget subcommittee. Okay. Yes, no? I, I don't, I, the one that we were talking about. This one. That yeah. Budget detail. Yeah. We're not going to talk about that one tonight. No, we already talked about the 23 budget. Yeah, I know. I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything else on there that you no. wanted to. Okay. No, no, no. We're good. Okay. We're good. All right. So we did the vote of the budget. Um, okay. So we did have new business discussion around the grounds maintenance service agreement discussion. Um, well, it was sent to you. Right. You all received it. Yeah. It's not like we have to vote on it. I just wanted you guys to be aware of what's being discussed um, at the town level in terms of helping to... Uh, take care of our grounds in a different way, in a different model. So, so maybe do we want to talk about we well, talk about before I don't that? know where we are on the town end, I think, because I, they're not sure if well, they we're going to be able to move forward. Travis right? had made some adjustments in the funding of yeah. it that was going to be less impactful in the 23 budget. Um, the, the, the need is there. If anybody thinks the need isn't there, right. we, know we can go take a walk tomorrow. The, the, um, but a friendly walk. <laughs> friendly walk. That was intimidating, I swear. I was not, not on the yellow line or anything. I got a, a bad look over there. A short <laughs> but no, it, it, it's, again, the town needs it. You know, everybody's had their children play in sports. We know the challenges compared to our fields compared to others. And so it's it's needed. Um, I would recommend support for the, for, the, for the project. They've adapted many, if not most, if not close to all of the recommendations that we put forward. Um, Good job. We're going to. Um, Sorry. We're going to put forward. Um, I mean, we're going to. There's going to be. In, there's enough meetings that are in that in the uh, statement of work, or if you want to call it, that I think we'd be able to make adjustments on the fly when needed. Um, I, I personally think we should give it a chance because the other alternative is to not do it. Right. So. so you guys have. You all know what I'm talking about, right? You all but, have that copy. But okay. the agreement itself is separate from whether or not the town would be able to fund it. Correct. Right. So right. You can. We can theoretically agree to the agreement. But that does not mean the town automatically is able to move forward. Correct, correct. But, right. Right. but I don't think they're looking for us to vote on it. Not it now. was more that I just wanted you to be aware that this is what's happening yeah. and it will impact the schools and that you know this is something that we've been working on with them for you know since the fall, but we were invited to participate in it in the fall. So yes, collective, head, the collective head nod, I think. Yes, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, collective. Great. Um, no newsletter. I think we're good. Okay. All right. So seeing no other business tonight, when we are moving our policy, all of those policies to our next meeting, which will be April 7th for our public hearing on our FY23 budget. Um, we don't have another, pres have another presentation that evening as well from Mr. McLeod. We have a technology um, presentation from Mr. McLeod, different from what he went over this time with us, which was unexpected. Yes, not capital, lovely. it would be on not capital. ongoing technology. Ongoing issues and, re and regrouping in terms of our strategy moving forward, because if, if you may recall called prior to the pandemic or just prior to the pandemic, um, Mr. McLeod had given a presentation on his kind of five-year rollout, and now, whoop, he's been completely <laughs> upended. So he's going to kind of rejigger that around and discuss that at our April 7th meeting. So be prepared for that. Is there any other presentation? We I was going to say, with the public budget hearing, you just remember, it is a legal requirement that you, that you hold. Yes, at. thank you. It is a hearing, means you hear from the public, not necessarily yeah, have to have a discussion. Sense. It opens on time. You, you vote to open it. You vote right. to close it. And you move on to the rest of the business of the meeting. So. Right. And so then... Go ahead. The Go ahead. March 22 meet with finance committee is that a, is that a that's Tuesday and that's with the, the subcommittee. Subcommittee, not yep. the committee. Well, you yep. You're allowed to come and, and sit support. in the audience and support us. Yes. In fact, that would be really lovely if you wanted to come do that. Mm -hmm. um, historically, you know, often the entire school committee comes and sits in. We don't. You don't, you don't say anything, but you can come. Yeah, we should, although I actually wouldn't be here. I, it's Sorry. Fine. I know you're not going to be here. It's fine. I'm just, I can't go you guys are going to, you're not all going to come. It's fine. remote. You it's a remote <laughs> meeting, but that's okay. I'll it's be, all remote. I'll you're not really sitting airplane. in, to be honest. You're it's just kind of remote. Yeah, it's on Sunday. It's remote. And it's at 7? It's at 7 o'clock, yeah. That's what I think we're presenting first. Probably. Likely. Maybe. Hopefully. And then, Ms. Menard, you're going to have just an update with for us on the professional development. Is there another professional development coming up after this is the last one? That's what I thought. April. She'll be prepping us for the next one, right? Correct. Cool. All right. Let's look at that. So remember that. Is that right? Go no, but that's All right. A so um, it is now 9.59. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, sorry. What's sorry. the matter? Can I just ask one more question before no. we go? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's 9.59. Um, at some point, 
Minnie and I are really excited to present right. a larger um, talk about the strategic, strategic planning plan. committee's work. Would yes. that be April 7th? I feel like that date was thrown oh. around, but that's the budget Ooh. hearing. No. So let, Ouch. Me, let me tell you, you can give an update, but we're going to be actually doing the draft proposal presentation would be May 5th. I have that down for Cinco de Mayo. Oh, yes, know? that's right. We talked about yes. the margaritas. Right, but I want, I but asked as far them, as giving, yes. Right, but I asked them to give me, you know, the highlights. Mm -hmm. I'll do it next time. Okay. Because, I, I mean, I do want to know what you guys It's been going on. great. That's all you need. <laughs> okay, but I just, I just, that's great. I just wanted to get, like, we are not in those meetings, so we wanted to know what specifically you guys so, are. Um, we have our next we can give up You birth? can, absolutely. Yes, because okay. I, I didn't even have you written down in here, so I'll do that. Because Monday night we'll have our fifth and final, theoretically. Cinco. Meeting, and we'll be having, then the draft will be coming out after that, so you'll have even more information to share after Monday nights. Okay, so I will actually put you on the agenda to talk about it, all right? Yes, make it a separate agenda. Okay, yes. Nope. <laughs> okay, so it is now, I'm gonna, is it 9.59? It is still 9.59. <laughs> yeah, it's at 9.59. It was a little up. I'm, I'm going for it. All right, um, I would, a motion to adjourn, please. I would entertain a motion. Move by Lisa. Second. Second. Move by Lisa, seconded by Minnie. Minnie. All in favor? Yeah. That's it. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining this evening, and good night.